Hello and welcome once again to F Sobriety. I am Craig Woods, although from this Bluetooth headset, you may have mistaken me just for the local douche. And I am James Hamilton, and I'll try the Pradas next. Welcome to F Sobriety. <laughs> nice choice. So James, what are we up to this week? We are on the Master Robot train once again. We are rounding off season one. Can you believe it? We got to the end of a whole season of Mr. Robot. Incredible. On this intrepid rewatch. We are a quarter of the way through the rewatch now, if you're a fan of percentages. 25%. That's roughly a quarter. Not to get all actually. (laughs) But it is less than that because some of the other seasons do have more episodes. But never mind that. Fine. You can prove anything with facts. (laughs) (laughs) To quote a famous taxi driver. Um... (laughs) Yeah, so we're going to be rounding off our Mr. Robot rewatch chat about Season 1 in this episode. Uh, So if you are here for that, I'm going to, in a moment, hand over to the Hamiltron, who can direct you as to where to go time-wise on the podcast. We do have a full plate of other things to talk about, though, James, in our customary culture roundup, looking at the contemporary landscape of happenings and goings-on in the world of music and... TV and all the other things we enjoy. And there have been a lot of goings on in those spheres. There certainly have been, and not to mention the world of social media, which, like it or not, we're also admired in, uh, like quicksand. What I imagine quicksand would be as a child, it's weird how that never had any effect whatsoever uh, in my adulthood. Where's all the quicksand, James? I've never experienced quicksand other than psychologically. (laughs) So on that note, I'm going to hand over to the Hamiltron, uh, who will kindly tell the Mr. Robot fans who are purely here for Mr. Robot chat and nothing else exactly where to go. Hamiltron, take it away. Are you seriously going to talk about all this shit before you get to Mr. Robot? Damn. Dear listener, to skip all this nonsense and get to the special juice of our spoiler-filled Mr. Robot rewatch discussion about Season 1, Episode 10, Zero Day, and the series as a whole, skip to around 1 hour, 19 minutes and 30 seconds. Now back to you pair of absolute goons. Always a treat, always a joy. There you go. So James, big, big couple of weeks or week and a half or so since we last spoke. What out there in the landscape of human culture, uh, such as it is in this here year 2021, has been catching your eyes, ears, uh, and senses generally? Well, Craig, I've mentioned this previously, and here we are. It's time. Buckle yourself in, gird your loins. Loins girded. Because it's time for James's review of Zack Snyder's Justice League. Oh, just what no one asked for. I watched all four hours of Zack Snyder's Justice League. Your medal is in the post. In the space of a week, that means I watched six hours of Justice League, because I, as I mentioned previously, watched Joss Whedon's 2017 Zack Snyder's Joss Whedon's <sighs> Justice League. Uh, oh and again, I believe I, I mentioned previously, one of literally the worst things I've ever had the misfortune to lay my eyes upon. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, to quote uh, Christian Bale, how was it? Well... I went into this film with what can only be described as basement level <laughs> expectations. Uh huh. And were those expectations rewarded? I hated Joss Whedon's cinematic quote unquote vision of it. And Zack Snyder, not one of my favourite filmmakers. Mm. I didn't like Man of Steel, I didn't like Batman v Superman. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a curve ball coming there here. There is a curve ball, but here's the thing. I don't know how I can objectively review this because I was constantly comparing it to Joss Whedon's. Right, but okay. all four hours, not going to lie, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a fun movie. A fun four-hour film. I had a good time watching it, and I was not fucking expecting that. I was expecting to come onto this podcast and rip it a new one. Now, I will admit, now I've, I've not seen this movie, and to be honest, I have no interest in ever watching it. You would hate it with a passion. I'm, I'm quite sure I would. <laughs> but I will say I was really surprised at the amount of positive reviews I saw for it like online from, uh, shall we say, reputable <laughs> publications and websites. That took me by surprise. Um, I was kind of expecting it for people to really stick their boot into it. Uh, And that did not happen. And I don't know whether that's part of just a a wave, uh, a wave of contrarianism (laughs) throughout the entire uh, commentary online. But all I know is it it took me by surprise. Not one single bit of it, however, makes me want to actually watch the movie. Well, I wonder how much of the uh, my my own included opinions on the movie are based on 
the theatrical release. How much of it is people giving Zack Snyder more sympathy than they might otherwise do, given the scenario that caused them to leave the project in the first place? Yeah. But yeah, one the first thing I'll say about this film is it wasn't as poor faced as I expected. Mm-hmm. There are lines in this film that I assumed Joss Whedon had put in to the theatrical version that were in the original script, but in context they made much more sense and kind of landed as jokes. Every character is given a backstory. Ray Fisher's cyborg is basically the main character of the movie. Okay. Whereas in Joss Whedon's Justice League, Cyborg was a side character with a couple of one-line jokes. More like Sideborg. He's no Cyborg from Doom Patrol. No, of course not. He's a fleshed out, or metaled out, I guess, character. <laughs> he's um, a semi-fleshed out. It was enjoyable. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. This is not a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination. It is no, flawed. Surely not. It is very, very flawed. Mm-hmm. But the stuff I enjoyed made up for the stuff that made me go, eh? Like, to be honest, Zack Snyder, Zack Snyder's original vision appears to be literally every second, every frame that he filmed is in this movie. <laughs> and then slowed down significantly. I think this could have made a great three-hour film. Right, uh uh, without cutting anything, just lose some of the slow <laughs> You've just reminded me, I did see a decent meme the other week there, where um, Carl Urban's Dread uh, walks up to the main characters of Zack Snyder's Justice League and says, uh, you're all under arrest for the use of slow-mo. <laughs> I was trying to put together how I would review this, because I figured at first, before I watched it, was like my review will be maybe five minutes of me sinking the boot in and then we'll move on. And then I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm swayed by this film a little bit. So what I'm going to do, listeners, is rather than try and contextualise it and review it, you can, there's a lot of reviews out there. You can watch any There's no shortage, reviews. that's for sure. But yeah. if you're listening to this portion of our podcast, I'm just going to read you verbatim the notes that I made while watching Zack Snyder's <laughs> Justice League. So here we go. This is uh, James's review of Zack Snyder's Justice League. Aged eight and a half. First of all, 4-3 ratio looks weird as fuck. Is this the 90s? Super shout! Understated credits. No CGI lip Superman. <laughs> fuck up, Joss Whedon. Wow, big shout. Wake every mother box up. Cool. <laughs> oh look, it's Lex again. Zack really loves Superman more than anyone else in the world. <laughs> Nay, Batman. Uh, Parademon fight. Fuck up, Joss Whedon. Part 2. <laughs> Part 1. Don't count on it, Batman. Storm's Grounded Chopper, Batman has to do a horse. Aquaman, <laughs> wow, 100 times more badass than before. Fuck you, capitalist Bruce Wayne. Jumper sniffing Bjork performance. <laughs> what? We'll come back to the jumper sniffing Bjork performance later. Sassy Alfred, Kent Farm for Sale. Aw, sad Lois. Look, more sad lady music cues. They told us gods would outlive us. Wow, on the nose. <laughs> The world in mourning. Man, Zack really does love Superman, but not as much as Zack loves violence. <laughs> Can I just say, before you go any further, these sound like the kind of notes I would make hating it. <laughs> okay, well, strap in. <laughs> so continuing from, wow, Zack loves violence. And F-bombs. And a Scottish cop. Then all caps, ha 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 ha. Wonder Woman does not give one single fuck. This film is amazing. <laughs> I know a lot of people were like, Wonder Woman shouldn't kill people, but that scene was so good. She oh, kills right. so many bad guys. Okay. She shatters Maybe it would have been guys. cool if it was a different character doing yeah, that I stuff. I could not give a fuck. It looked amazing. It was fun. She obliterates a guy till just his hat <laughs> is left. I was in stitches laughing. I don't have as much fondness for these DC characters as people who get upset by Batman killing people and Wonder Woman mm. killing I'm people. I'm starting to get a sense that your enjoyment of this movie was very sort of nihilistic in character. Meanwhile, in Thermoscura, big fight. This is longer than before. Steppenwolf looks much better, TBH. Part 2, The Age of Heroes. This is a thrill ride. Steppenwolf loves him some toxic shit. Steppenwolf wants to impress your boy Darkseid. More Alfred sass. Aw, Bruce feels guilty. More Zack Snyder's music cues. Bonus Willem Dafoe. Flashback. David Thulis kicks fuck out of Darkseid. That's the end of my review of part two. <laughs> I liked it. I liked the brevity. Yep. I started to take less notes as it went on because it was kind of I was like kind of engrossed yeah. in the film, so I stopped taking notes. Part three: 
beloved mother, beloved son. Barry Allen meets Iris West. Aw, truck idiot. <laughs> He's my least favourite DC character, to be fair, truck idiot. Song to the Siren and Slow Mo Hot Dogs. What is this, Lost Highway? Yeah, it's Song to the Siren, but not the This Mortal Coil version. And not the original, it's another. Not Tim Buckley either. It's a more recent cover. Oh, in a scene with slow motion hot dogs flying through the air while the Flash rescues Iris West from a car crash. Barry Allen's doggo meat snack. Steppenwolf is having some Atlanteans. Cyborg gets a story and is literally a hacker god. Insert hacker man <laughs> gif. <laughs> Cyborg says fuck the world. Cyborg is literal Mr. Robot. Part 4. Change Machine. Oh, we're nearly done. <laughs> Wonder Woman reviews Justice League. <laughs> Quote unquote, darkness, death, misery. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Allen hasn't fallen over once. Fuck you, Joss Whedon. Gal Gadot can't act her way out of a paper bag, but damn, she looks amazing as Wonder Woman. <laughs> Lots of extra comic book nonsense. Who is it? Martha. Why did you say that name? <laughs> Two and a quarter hours into this film, they've just come up with the idea to resurrect Superman and it genuinely makes more sense than the theatrical version. Brackets turn smoke into a house. <laughs> Martian Manhunter drop. Part 5. All the King's Horses. Does Wonder Woman go for younger guys? This red cape charges back. This film is not as po-faced as I thought it would be. Wow, they fucked up the timing of the mother box and Barry uses the speed force to reverse time. It's almost like someone understands the powers of the Flash. Yas, nay CGI top lip. <laughs> what? Yas, nay CGI top lip. No, I heard you. What does it mean? It means Superman doesn't have a CGI top lip. Did he have a CGI top lip? Oh, yeah. Did, are you unaware of the... No, I, this is news to me. Okay, so in Joss Whedon's Justice League... When they got Henry Cavill back to do more reshoots so that Joss Whedon could have, I guess, some more funny slash misogynistic shit going on in his film, Henry Cavill was filming Mission Impossible Fallout, I think, and had grown a big old moustache for it. Ah, okay. And the producers of Justice League were like, can they shave it? And the producers of Mission Impossible were like, no, because we're still filming. And they were like, what if he shaves it and then we pay for the most expensive, most realistic looking moustache like fake moustache money can buy and we'll pay for it so that he can continue and Mission Impossible Fallout we're like, no yeah, why don't you no. just CGI his moustache out if you've got that much money, so they did and it looked terrible <laughs> okay, I was unaware of that so does, wait, so does Superman have a moustache in this movie? Oh no, because in the new one they didn't use any of Joss Whedon's reshoots this is all the original stuff that oh, Zack Snyder okay, shot okay. what a tangled web what a tangled tash. Silas does a sacrifice. Part six, something darker. Oh, that's what that's what we needed. Heavy Jesus metaphors given Superman was created by two Jewish guys. Big action freeze frame. Capital letters, Cyborg doesn't give one fuck. This ending battle is a hundred times more fun. And, uh, wow, they really do just straight up murder Steppenwolf. Uh, epilogue, a father twice over. Here's what you could have won. <laughs> Fuck Jared Leto. GTFO. You suck. <laughs> Martha Manhunter. The end. Well, that was a treat, James. I, I, I feel like I watched the movie with you. 5.5 fives out of 9. Okay, I, I, that, <laughs> it's not as high as I thought you were maybe going to go. That, that was a sensible score, it seems like. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm never going to watch it again. Yeah, yeah but okay. I had more fun watching it than I could possibly have anticipated. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, yeah. You've not done anything to entice me into ever watching this thing. No, I, fact, I think I could say with almost 100% certainty that you would fucking hate this film. <laughs> and you would hate me if I tried to get you to watch it and you watched it because you'd be like, you owe me four hours, James, give mm, me a back. That's four hours I'll never get back. Yep. I think the only way anybody is ever going to get me to watch that movie is if they release a Schneider cut wherein all of the actors are overdubbed by Fred Schneider of the B-52s, uh, just delivering all the same dialogue that's in the movie, but in his distinctive Sprecky saying, We all live in a society! <laughs> I know that's not in the movie. I, I don't, don't do it, actually. I know that. We're heading on down to the Batcave. Um, <laughs> I, heard, I heard after the, um, after the fact that they just let Jared Leto um, improvise his lines, and I'm like, why? 
for the love of God, why would you do that? No script could have been worse than than what he said. So, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a treat. That's, I'm glad we uh, I'm glad we checked that box. That we're definitely still relevant in terms of uh, uh, the the commentary that we offer on the contemporary cultural landscape. We did we did not let Justice League slip through our fingers. Thank God. The best summary of this film that I saw was from Red Letter Media, who said that the 2017 Justice League theatrical release was a butchered mess, but mm-hmm. Zack Snyder's Justice League was an unbutchered mess. The only other review, well, the only review that I've taken any uh, interest in or paid attention to was one given by a friend of mine, my friend Alan Todd, who is part of the crew on uh, the Big Glasgow comic page. He is on their podcast with three other guys regularly, uh, and their podcast review of that movie was really pretty funny, if only for the fact that three out of the four of them were all pretty positive on it. And my pal Alan came away saying legitimately it is the worst thing he has ever seen. Uh, and that podcast is worth listening to just for how frustrated Alan gets. Um, <laughs> I, there's a running joke on their podcast, actually, that Alan is the guy who hates everything. And Alan's getting extremely frustrated saying, but the only reason it seems that way is because you've legitimately talked about things that I do hate. There's plenty of things I do really like. Uh, and you've insisted in talking about this movie that you knew I wouldn't like. Uh, but it's pretty funny. They're all trying to be positive, and their main guy, Ian, is particularly trying to always uh, swing it in a positive direction. And you, if you watch the video version of it, you can always see his face clinching slightly when he has the hand over to Alan, knowing that there's going to be a barrage of negativity on its way. Um, so I'll put a link to that in our, in our episode description. Yep, please do. Alan responded to one of my fairly positive tweets about it, um, making a great joke about it. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but it involved Batman telling Joker to fuck up, so, <laughs> which gave me a genuine lull. So thanks for that, Alan. For That's what all iterations of Batman are essentially missing. <laughs> well, while you were doing that, wasting four hours of your life doing that... It was more like had, four and a half with breaks. I had a couple of days uh, last week there where I had no broadband. My uh, broadband... <laughs> Here's a tale... Uh, in fact, I'll just tell this tale briefly. It turned out the reason I had no broadband for a couple of days was because there was a fire out the back of my clothes. Um, and there was a bunch of fly tip stuff there, and it had caught a light. And the reason it had caught a light, it looks like... Uh, I'm not saying they got Robert De Niro from backdrafting to confirm this. <laughs> I'm just saying I think the likelihood is it was a stray firework. And... Uh, listeners, if you're outside Glasgow and you don't understand this nonsense uh, all I can say is I live in an area of Glasgow that's very close to the Rangers football stadium and is therefore it's in an area where there's a strong, what I call pseudo-pantomime loyalist sentiment uh, where there is this Diet Coke version of, you know, (laughs) the loyalism that occurs in Belfast Uh, people for some fucking reason in this part of the world think they are part of that conversation when in fact they couldn't be any further from it. But anyway, the last couple of weeks, uh, the fans of Rangers have, let's just say, they've been a bit ill-behaved. Uh, I'm putting it mildly. Um, and there's been a lot of impromptu firework displays have been taking place. So basically what happened was one of the fireworks landed out the back and amongst all that fly tip stuff, there was a fire and it burned away a whole bunch of landline cables. So for a couple of days, the open reach engineers were here and they had to replace a whole bunch of cables. So I was without internet for uh, for a whole two days. So what you're um, saying though, Craig, before you carry on, is that so not only does your average Rangers fan live in the past, but they seem set on having other people live in the past as well by <laughs> getting rid of the internet. Yes, uh, by sending us... I, I believe they wouldn't have stopped here. Uh, do everything they can to get us back to the days prior to the use of electricity <laughs> um, but anyway without internet I was uh, I was forced to go back to uh, physical media for a couple of days just to entertain myself uh, which is fine on the one hand I do read a lot anyway so I'm partial to a book as we'll, as we'll discuss and have discussed on this podcast well looks like we got ourselves a reader but uh, I decided we'd I think on a previous episode or maybe we didn't say it on on the podcast, I can't actually remember, but recently, James, we had toyed with the idea, or I certainly brought it up as a possibility that we should 
maybe think about doing some coverage on Twin Peaks The Return on the podcast mm-hmm. and I thought I'm going to give that a wee look but I didn't get around to it but then on those two days I had no broadband I thought who knows how long this has gone on for 18 hours of David Lynch at his absolute maximum David Lynch fuck it let's do it so I went back in and I watched the entirety of Twin Peaks The Return over 48 hours yeah man it's it's still a treat it's still a treat it's a feast and uh like, every time I watch that now, I come away from a ho- with a whole different set of perceptions about, first of all, my feelings on exactly... My interpretation of the ending changes slightly each time. Um, I find myself going back, on fo- back and forth on certain things. Like, I remember the second time I watched Twin Peaks The Return, the Las Vegas stuff with Dougie really annoyed me. <laughs> And then I watched it again and I was fine with it. And then I watched it again and it annoyed me again. And this time around I was fine again. For some reason I go back and forth on that. To be clear, I don't ever, there's not a part of me that ever thinks that it shouldn't be there or it should not have happened. I absolutely appreciate everything that part of the show is doing. But there were, I, I know at the time, back in 2017 when it aired, that really tried so many people's patience that a lot of people just dropped off of it. And, you know, for them, it's the worst thing that's ever happened. There are people who feel that the, the return tarnished Twin Peaks. I certainly don't feel that way. I think the return is amazing, even when I do get frustrated by elements of it. But as we discussed, I think, on our very first podcast episode, James, part of the appeal of that show and that entire franchise generally is that it just doesn't follow the rules of established television in any conceivable respect or of any narrative media whatsoever <laughs> no right exactly and, and david lynch is doing everything he can in places to piss you off but he's not doing it to troll you and i think that's what some people mistakenly think that he's being arch and he's trying to annoy everyone i think frustration is a different thing from uh, annoyance or making people angry the frustration is important in Twin Peaks The Return because it, it, it makes you engage with the text in a way that no other TV show is making you you know, engage with the text. Mm-hmm. David Lynch does not particularly care if one episode has enough satisfying moments away from the frustration or if one episode is literally all frustration. He does not care because in the scheme of things, he's looking at it as one body of work and it, the whole thing plays that way. It does actually benefit from a binge watch to be honest, it benefits yeah. from that more than it does on a weekly basis. Although I have to say, I would never swap the weekly experience we had for anything because it was so much fun. Oh yeah, the week uh, to week talking about what the fuck did we just see was incredible. Yeah, it was great. I miss our Twin Peaks summer. It was it was great fun. Yeah, but having said that, David Lynch and Mark Frost did intend it as basically being one eighteen-hour piece. So yeah, you know. yeah. And certainly when you binge watch it, you really do get much more of a concrete sense of that. I mean, I don't know how you could binge watch it in one day. I'm sure people have done it. But I, I, as much as I love the show, I think that would drive me insane. A lot of coffee. Two days was quite enough. Thank you very much. Coffee um, and the water filter is the way to go. <laughs> but I did come away some, with some new interpretations that I do kind of think I would like to talk about at some point. So I'm thinking maybe we should... Even if it's just one episode, we can discuss it. We can discuss what we're going to do. Even if but even if it's just one episode, we do as a an overall looking back on the return. There's definitely some new uh, new insights. I think I, uh, that I would offer that I would not have offered in a previous conversation. I, it's been a while since I've watched it, so I could I'd definitely be down for. Oh, by the way, I will it. say even even after having just binge watched it, I'll happily watch it again. <laughs> I, I'll happily watch it again. I mean. It, the thing about that show is, like all of David Lynch's work, it's like a pure sensory experience. I mean, even if you if you don't give a shit about the narrative or the narrative really annoys you so much that you get zoned out of it, you don't care about any of the characters, it sort of almost doesn't matter because there's a whole other level that you can ascend to or, or drift off to within the work itself. Like It's just put together in such a kind of spellbinding way that if you let it wash over you, it'll still be rewarding, you know? And I don't think there's any other comparable text in modern television that you can really say that about. Mm-hmm. For sure. So, we'll put a pen in that, but I think uh, well, I, there could be some Twin Peaks coverage somewhere down the pike. In the meantime, everyone take a drink. That was a big Twin Peaks reference. Yeah, to just finish your drink, pour yourself another. <laughs> On a superhero televisual point, as we were talking about previously... Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been keeping up with Marvel slash Disney Plus's superhero TV output following mm-hmm. one division, the uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Or Falcon and the Winter Soldier, if you're American, <laughs> I guess. I'm not going to tell you how to speak. You pronounce birds however you want. 
I, I am going to tell him how to speak when it comes to pronouncing my name, but carry on. It's your thing, Craig. <laughs> Craig, I believe is how they pronounce it for some fucking reason. But um, carry on. <laughs> I'm um, not better about it. It's fun. First episode was a bit slow, had an action sequence in it, and then was kind of mostly set up. Second episode, uh, more action. It's it's far more bog standard mm-hmm. Marvel fare than One Division was. They've like there's it's obviously a completely different animal from One Division. It's big budget action, and to be fair, mm-hmm. it's big. It's action in a TV show that you don't get in other TV shows because if you're into like action TV shows, other shows can't afford what they're doing. You know, no, sure. This has had so much money thrown at it that each week has an action set piece that would be like the big action set piece in a movie. But yeah, it's fun. It's basically a Lethal Weapon, the TV show, but not Lethal Weapon, the TV show. If you ever saw the Lethal Weapon TV show. No, I didn't. But with one of them can fly and one of them's got a metal arm. <laughs> right. Well, um, it's fair going big into more recent Captain America uh, storylines. Then, so yeah. it's it's got less in common with your with your Stan Lee kind of stuff, uh, and more in common uh, with your like Robert Morales. Um, it's leaning heavily into the Truth, Red, White, and Black series. I don't know if you ever read that. No. It's. I think it's. This is post either of us having read comics. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of stuff in it about Isaiah Bradley, the first Captain America, an African American uh, soldier who was experimented on before they gave the serum to Captain America. Because obviously, why would the U.S. military have given an experimental treatment to a blonde-haired white guy in mm-hmm. the 1930s slash 40s? So it's kind of leaning into that. Um, based on, I believe the truth, Red, White, and Black storyline was based on real tests the US military did on African American soldiers in World War Two. They tested the equipment on them that before they put it into the field, so like the effectiveness of gas masks and stuff were, were basically they were tested on black soldiers before they mm. were given to white soldiers. So it's kind of it leans into that a little bit. It leans into the idea of the post it's again it's like grinding the um the post You can hear me blip sighing thing. here. <laughs> yeah. It's grinding the, the post blip um no. thing much heavier than uh, yeah. One Division yeah. did, and then Spider Man Far From Home did. I, I've not watched this show, uh, but, well, regular listeners, if you weren't already put off, you will remember me saying that after One Division, I just didn't particularly feel like continuing with the MCU, which I already had felt prior before One Division found a way to ensnare me. One Division again. briefly tricked you. They were like, <laughs> <laughs> then you saw the man behind the curtain again, you're like, fuck, there's that mouse. Yeah. Hey. No I have not watched this show and I have no interest in watching it, but not just because I, I'm back to having MCU fatigue, but I knew from the concept of that show that this was just going to be more of very much down the line of um, basically military imperialist propaganda disguised as woke middle of the road liberal. You know what I'm saying. I mean, that's not a correct take at all. It's the opposite of military imperialist propaganda. All the military are being you. shown as like basically the villains, and the villains that are being introduced are being shown as not the villains. That do- that doesn't stop it from being military propaganda, though. Uh, see, it's really simplistic to think that if you if you always sh- even if you show uh, the military, you know, people in the military being a bit evil, that somehow stops it from being military propaganda. Uh, that's not how this stuff works. First of all, all of these shows are made with the permission of the military. Uh, and the US military will not give permission to do, for, for any of these things to do anything that they deem, uh, you know, puts them in too much of a bad light. And so all of this stuff is basically delivered to us with the approval of the US military. Um, now, I've not seen the show, so I can't comment fully, but I have read other things people have said about it. For example, I, I've, rem- I've mentioned Sharonda J. Brown on this show, on this podcast before. And I trust her opinion about everything. <laughs> and she was she was one of the first people I read uh, talking about this. Uh, and she was basically saying, it is one of those shows that just tries to pull that same liberal smokescreen uh, of presenting evil in the military as being some kind of abstract force. Uh, but ultimately, it does nothing to question the fact, uh, it does nothing to question the, the nature of imperialism or the existence of imperialism. Uh, and all the stuff that you were talking about earlier about the racial element of it uh, for her personally uh, and again I reiterate I've not seen the show but I'm just paraphrasing what Sharonda J. Brown said 
uh, which was exactly the same. It, it's, she compared it to it's basically the popular culture version of uh, the Obama administration, which says you present yourself as being progressive, but ultimately the show's purpose is really one that just upholds the status quo. And, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say any more about it. I, I'm, I, I can't say much more about it because I haven't watched it. So I don't, you know, I don't want people pouncing on me saying, why are you criticising a show you haven't watched? Guys, get on at Twitter. At F Sobriety Cast, Craig Woods, <laughs> bad takes, bad face but, takes. But that's why I would never watch this show. I get no interest in watching it. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, I don't see it being your your, your favourite show ever if you, if you ever ended up watching it. Brie Larson's two-hour recruitment ad for the US Air Force was enough for me. I don't need any more of that bullshit from Marvel or anyone else. You heard it here first. Well, no, you heard it in an <laughs> earlier episode of F Sobriety first. <laughs> But I, for one, am enjoying it. So far, I know you'll be disappointed to hear this, Craig. No Mephisto. <laughs> We're two episodes in, no one's Mephisto yet. I have been watching it for the I, w- I want though, to put on the record I'm... that I did not care that there was no Mephisto. <laughs> Anytime there's a, a mysterious figure alluded to in Falcon and the Winter Soldier so far, I've tweeted Sarah to say, or texted Sarah to say, it's Mephisto. <laughs> <laughs> and I think she's tiring of it. And we're only two episodes in. Or maybe it'll turn out to be Festo from Masters of the Universe. <laughs> Oh. Me festo, you festo, Ibdi's festo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hip or Willy reference for the kids. Right, it's, good, uh, it's a good laugh. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is your favourite show ever. Falcon. You, <laughs> you can't take it back. Falcon and the Winter Soldier, <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Anyway, I don't mean to come across all Alan Todd about this. <laughs> don't want to be the one negative guy in this podcast, so maybe we should move on. If we've got the super he- heroism out of the way, if in Leicester set anything more you want to follow up on that subject. How about... The James Gunn's The Suicide Squad trailer that I believe they say dropped last week. Oh, okay, yeah. Looks like fun. It's got a big shark in it and Starro. All right, moving it looks on. Like, it, looks, it looks like Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy, but not in space. Yeah, it's the Guardians of the Galaxy if the Guardians were bad guys. And it looks like there's a lot of people that are going to die in it. So more Suicide Squad than the previous Suicide Squad. Even more suicidal than ever before. <laughs> more suicide than a uh, Suicidal Tendencies album. <laughs> Are they still going? Oh, who knows? Maybe somebody out there can tell us. I do literally have one more superhero thing to mention. Oh, go on. Uh, I watched the first episode of Invincible. Uh, I'm not aware of it. It is Robert Kirkman, the writer of The Walking Dead comics and stuff. It's a superhero comic that he wrote years ago. is now an animated show on Amazon Prime. Uh, I watched the first episode. It was a good laugh. I've watched one episode, so I can't really say much about it. No spoilers. It was an enjoyable 45 minutes. I'll probably watch the rest of it. If anything amazing happens, I'll be sure to like jump on you like I was with the boys. But otherwise, I'll just say you may or may not enjoy this show. All right. Well, I'll that, stick a pin in it. That was a valid 20 seconds of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we move on, uh, while I was on the subject of Sharonda J. Brown there, I promise she is not paying me for this. I mean, it'd be, she would want her money back, frankly. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Sharonda J. Brown. <laughs> In addition to our work on Wear Your Voice magazine, which is a great publication, it's a great website, uh, uh, I encourage everyone to go and look at it. But she also does work with uh, a thing called Black Youth Project, which, as the title suggests, is very much focused on empowerment for young black people through popular culture. She wrote a great article in the past week, that really spoke to me because, and while I tell you what, I'll just quote a bit from it and you'll see why it, I, I read this, thought, yes, more of this. But she was talking about how black characters interact with the concept of time travel. Uh, and she criticised a lot of things. She criticised basically most of the um, portrayals of that we ever see. Uh, there's, in fact, a Spike Lee movie that I forget the name of uh, that involves time travel. And a lot of people were hailing that as being quite progressive because of the way that it subverted the time travel narrative by and, and making it very relevant to the black experience. Sharonda J. Brown was not keen on it because basically without giving anything away about the end of that movie, she said that all it really does at the end of that movie is that it hammers home this sense of hopelessness and this sense of black people constantly being victims. It doesn't actually do anything to reverse that trend. So she says, I don't want any more black time travel stories that don't do the kind of works 
I so desperately want them to do. They don't have any real catharsis for black people. I know the value of black nihilism, but God damn, I want us to be able to escape into these stories. We're already well aware of the constant threat of violence to black bodies and both the casual and deliberate anti-blackness of the past and present, and that will continue into our future even as we fight tirelessly against it. If, Tory, if, if stories with black time travellers only serve to give us reminders of this ugly truth, I think it's fair to question whether they really do anything productive for black people. I want time travel narratives to do more than this. I want black time travellers to be a threat to the status quo. I say let black time travellers burn all the ships headed for Africa and the ones headed for the new world. Let black time travellers commune with their ancestors and warn them about just how far and how deep the malignancy of whiteness can reach. And let them kill or castrate the white man who tries to force himself on their great-grandmother just to save her the heartache, even if it means they might no longer exist or create a time paradox in the process. Fuck this timeline anyway. I want black time travellers to fuck up white history for the sake of black futures. That's one of the most powerful bits of writing I've read in a while. And the reason it excites me so much, as you might have picked up on, is that uh, it wanders a wee bit into Codex Widdershin's territory. Uh, hashtag plug, listeners. That's a project I've been working on for a few years. Who knows when it will see fruition. Available wherever good books are sold in the future. But without giving anything away, uh, James, there is a character in Codex Widdershin's that this actually applies to. And that's all I'm going to say about that. That also falls... And I think with one of the problems you had with, I say you as if it was, wasn't both of us, but you were more vocal about it. Lovecraft Country. Yeah, that was my principal problem with that episode. They had, they had a real chance to do something meaningful there, and I, they kind of shat the bed, in my opinion. Uh, and Sharonda J. Brown, incidentally, she did, after we recorded that podcast, I did actually notice she, of course, went on to say the same thing. Yeah, I don't want to say too much about that now, because there's things I don't want to spoil for you, because I know that you're the one person on Earth that's invested in Codex with us. I'm going to read the shit out of that. <laughs> but that does apply directly to... Uh, an, uh, there's a certain divergence, or rather, convergence of possibilities where that is relevant to one particular character. On that subject, this has allowed me a perfect segue to bring up again. A couple of episodes ago, I was talking about... Um, a project at CERN involving Moore Mother and her creative partner Rashida Phillips uh, called Black Quantum Futurism. Uh, there was a, an update about that on CERN's own website in the last week, uh, which I'll, I'll link in the episode description here, but it's just confirming a bit more about what the ethos behind the project is and what it actually involves. Uh, and. <laughs> the, some of the answers to the in the interview are just so great. It's classic Moore Mother. It's like she can just... I, I don't know. See, to be able to do that just in casual conversation, uh, I would love to be able to do it just for the uh, the purposes of this podcast, and I'm sure the listeners would love it too. Uh, if I could actually be uh, half as eloquent verbally as I am on paper, um, then we, you know, this would be a much more pleasurable listen. But her answers to some of these questions are just fantastic. But uh, some of the information she gives here, I'll just quote a wee bit of it. Uh, she's talking about the rise in popularity of Afrofuturism as a cultural movement. She says, Afrofuturism prompted us to think about alternative temporalities, how time imprints itself on communities, and how time plays out in the lives of marginalised and oppressed people who have uneven access to both their histories and their futures. In our work, we focus on the future's temporal domain and how it can be shaped or reconfigured by Afro-diasporic ontology and existence. Time and temporality, as explored through that, consist of multiple dimensions, not just mechanical, linear clock time or other conventional and historical measures. Based on our research, black and Afro-diasporan temporalities and traditions of time share many parallels with quantum principles. The past intermingles with the present, interwoven with the future. <laughs> and you can see why that excites me, James. Yep. <laughs> Hashtag blog. Not only that, but I'll bet she doesn't start drinking fucking beer and wine before she does. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not well, think that helps? <laughs> I wonder if maybe our whole approach to this podcast has a negative impact on our uh, eloquence. But no, yeah, we should change. We should change the title of the podcast to "Yay Sobriety," to, or just "Hmm Sobriety." <laughs> uh, but you no, know, yeah, I'm super excited about this uh, project. Uh, but from every word that she says in that quote, there, it sounds like she's just got a big list of woodsy buttons that she's pushing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's an artist I'm so thankful exists. Everything she does says thanks. It's it's like Christmas every time she di she appears on my timeline for any reason. Speaking of 
black female excellence, Craig. Mm-hmm. Did you happen to catch Janelle Monae's Ralph Lauren performance? I did, yes. It was pretty special. That was quite stunning. I watched it twice in a row. It was pretty amazing. Janelle never disappoints. No, yeah. And she was giving it proper jazz in her vocals, which I really appreciated. Uh, that that woman has range. Mm-hmm. The style and the style and range of her vocals. The band were so tight. Mm-hmm. She played some older tunes. She did, oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, some quite uh, snazzy renditions of some old favourites. Yeah, I'll link that in the in the episode description as well. Not gonna lie, I uh, I skipped the the modelling part of the like the first few minutes. <laughs> just went straight to the performance. So you know. Yeah, straight to the money shot as it were. Sure, Ralph Lauren doesn't need my fucking eyes on. Uh, he's down to his last seven yachts. Yeah. <laughs> like oh, if I missed a jacket. I might like to buy. Doubt it. <laughs> as long as he's paying Janelle Money to do an excellent jazz performance, though, if I can keep throwing the money our way. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that, these are some of the uh, things that we've been using to distract ourselves as the dystopian landscape of 2021 uh, just continues unbridled. Oh yeah, uh, speaking of the, the dystopian landscape of uh, 2021, I don't know if you happened to see the, the footage from David Lammy on LBC. I did, oh, yeah. I didn't know whether I wanted to punch myself in the face or just punch the woman <laughs> caller in the face so hard, but man. It, it was pretty painful. It was some, there was some top level ignorance. It was being painted pretty well, pretty clearly in big letters. <laughs> Yeah, for for the benefit of the listener, uh, David Lammy is an MP for the Labour Party. Uh, he's a black man, uh, if you're not familiar with British politics. And this woman, uh, who's a member of the public, but she was basically implying uh, that he was not as British as her <laughs> because of the colour of his skin, essentially. Uh, she did not come out and say it that way, but that was the heavy implication of what she said. She said he couldn't describe himself as Afro-Caribbean mm-hmm. and also English. And he was like, yeah. but my parents were from the Caribbean, yeah. which was part of the British Empire, and came yeah. to the motherland, and I was born and raised here. How about my children? Are they English? And she said, well, you can be British, but you can't be English. He made a valid... <sighs> oh, which God. is like, what? He made a really valid point that he was said that he's had his DNA ancestry done once, and that he has like, Scottish heritage, presumably from slavery yeah. in the past. Yeah. He was very polite in how he... like alluded to how that DNA probably came into his family lineage and she said if I was born in the Caribbean I couldn't be white Caribbean could I? <laughs> to which David Lamy <laughs> replied maybe you should go to the Caribbean and see all the white Caribbean people. <laughs> right, yes, yeah it's incredible. Uh, and then she went on to say that she just uh, thought it was sad that r- r- racial purity was being polluted. Oh, Jesus like, Christ. Wow. So we Shall we go back and speak to the Beaker people about that? Yeah, it was pretty great. So <laughs> David Lammy was, was much more uh, eloquent and polite than I guess a lot of people would have been, and uh, mm-hmm. someone suitably owned her with facts. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty, 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 pretty bad. Pretty grim. But this has been, this is the kind of shit that's been taking place against the backdrop of uh, ongoing political protests in this country. The big thing at the moment. Uh, well, one of the big things at the moment is against the, uh, I think I'm blanking on the exact name of it currently, but the policing crime bill. Policing, pro- uh, policing powers bill-, bill is to get there you go. police more powers. Right, and it essentially uh, is go- it's an- going to be an easy tool with which to just silence protest and ban protest, essentially. And so people are quite rightfully protesting against that bill. And there are, it's it's centred on the city of Bristol mainly these protests, I'm saying this for the benefit of people outside the UK, I'm sure everybody else knows this mm-hmm. um, and man, it's the fact that this I sometimes, honestly man every every day now I wake up, keep expecting that r- reality in our social political landscape is going to get slightly less dystopian uh, and every day I get sucker punched and uh, I don't think I'm a naive person, but somehow I keep getting myself in this pattern. <laughs> How did I get out of it? Uh, I was seeing the protests and seeing everyone with signs saying kill the bill really mm. took me back to when I was a lad justice protesting bill. the yeah. criminal justice bill. Yeah, same here. Back in the day, eh? Remember? Remember? Early 90s. Remember the 90s? Same, same were the days. Back when we had to protest to kill the bill and, uh, well, here we are in 2021 and apparently that's still a thing that has to happen. Now we all still have to go out in the street and protest against Quentin Tarantino making any money. 
<laughs> on, a, on a more light-hearted note about how uh, how much of a fucking crab mentality shit fest the uh, Britain is, do you see uh, all the uh, British immigrants getting kicked out of Spain? I did, yes. I rubbed my hands with glee at this. It was delicious. Uh, they were getting all these people that lived in the Costa del Sol, British citizens who lived in Spain, who had voted for Brexit, being horrified to discover that they were basically being told to leave Spain and return to the UK. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Guy uh, who was particularly interviewed saying that his wife was in tears and she couldn't believe they were being forced out. Apparently, someone in the Spanish Foreign Ministry was uh, interviewed as to what he would say to people who were losing their homes in Spain, and his response was, We took back control. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, for people outside the UK who don't know this is a thing, but there is a huge thing in certain parts of Europe, Western Europe, Spain specifically is the big hotspot for it, where a lot of British people go uh, and have either second homes there or they just move there completely, but they don't do anything to integrate with Spanish culture. They simply just replicate uh, their bit of little England. And most of these people are usually quite reactionary. There's no usually, but they always are quite reactionary in terms of their politics. They're pretty right wing, very traditionalist, but not traditionalist enough that they want to actually stay in the country. Uh, and pay taxes and whatnot. Uh, they want to live in another country, but just replicate England in somebody else's country. And so all of these people, their politics being as it is, they, of course, they all voted for Brexit, not thinking ahead that it may well mean that they would have to go back to the UK. Uh, and now that it's happening, their chickens are coming home to roost. I could feast on it all day. It's so delicious watching. The, the tears are so salty and every one of them is delicious. Fuck these people. Yeah, seeing the consequences of people's actions play out in real time. Well, 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 if it isn't the consequences <laughs> of my own actions. <laughs> Fucked around, found out. <laughs> exactly. I suppose the other thing that's going on here at the moment on a nationwide, UK nationwide level is of course the non-stop back and forth shit show of how exactly the Westminster government are handling or mishandling the pandemic at which of course we are still uh, we're still embroiled in I was and, listening uh, to the Weekly Planet podcast from Mr. Sunday Movies, I think I've mentioned them in the podcast before, two Australian guys they talk about like comic book stuff, pop culture that kind of thing, and uh, one of them was talking about how he was doing a live appearance at a comedy festival in Melbourne, and I was like, they're having indoor comedy festivals in Melbourne, and we're locked down. <laughs> Hiya. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, and the the thing is as well, and I'm sure this is happening in a lot of countries, but it's happening to in such an egregious extent in this country. The Conservative government are doing everything they can to really capitalise on people's exhaustion with the pandemic to push as much reactionary policy as possible. Uh, thus, we get things like the bill that we just mentioned. Uh, and the other thing that's happening lately is the government are really trying to hammer home just how important the UK flag is uh, and just how important unionism is. You know, this always happens. You only have to look through history. I mean, you only have to look through what happened in Europe in the 1930s. This shit just happens whenever there's a, a large-scale crisis. Reactionary governments will do everything they can to convince a confused and knackered public that, hey, it's okay, we've got you, as long as you subscribe to all of these very shallow and loosely defined tenets of national identity, you'll be fine. And it's really just you know, a push towards more draconian measures, more draconian policy, increasingly reactionary politics. Uh, this whole thing about the flag is ridiculous, man. Now they want flags on every fucking public building. And it's like, just give, give us a fucking rest, man. I mean, I don't know about you. That's one of the things that always creeps me out about the USA, and I'm glad we don't have it over here. Uh, and again, Americans, I'm not picking on you. I just, there's just certain elements of your culture that are a bit weird to our eyes. But having, you know, flags draped over every public building is just fucking weird. And this weird uh, ceremonial fucking occult-like reverence for a piece of cloth is just so bizarre. Actually, you know what, man? I think that combined with the confusion around the ever-changing and ever-nonsensical uh, approach to managing the pandemic, I'm at a point now where it's like, it, I, can we now just meet up with whoever as long as we're underneath a flag? <laughs> is that how, is that how uh, the, the tiers are working now? Is that how the pandemic restrictions work? You can meet up to six people from three households if they're all holding a flag. 
this goes up to 5,000 people from uh, 4,723 households if all flag bearers uh, are standing around a statue of Winston Churchill. How much money did the UK government spend on redoing the government's Westminster press room to yeah. look like a British version of the White House press room with British flags draped all over it, looking like some sort of 2080 Nazi joke <laughs> from the 70s? It's like a Renaissance fair, though. I mean, it just looks pathetic. I mean, other countries might just look at this and think, what the f-? You're doing real injustice to the Renaissance fair with that statement, man. Renaissance fairs are fun. <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson spent was it two point eight million or twenty eight million? It was there's a two and every penny well spent to have British flags hanging all over the place in a room where he now has to stand and answer questions about his sex life. <laughs> <laughs> like the flags are gonna protect him. Yeah, yeah. That in itself I don't think we need a, a more apt visual metaphor for the state of Britain at the moment. The state of the UK. Maybe it won't be so you in the UK for too much longer. Oh, on that subject, <laughs> do we want to mention what's going on in Sc- Scottish politics? I just guess anyone, <laughs> anyone's not aware of the, of the shit show. So for anybody who doesn't know, former First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond, f- former leader of the SNP. Uh, big, big Hansy, Big Hansy Salmond. Big, Hansy McSexpest, that's his uh, handle on gropes.com. <laughs> it's the guy if you looked at him if he was at a wedding and you were there with like any young female relatives you'd be like I stay away from that when he looks like a bit of a wrong him. <laughs> so he started his own party vying for Scottish independence because he splintered off from the SNP and he and Nicola uh, don't talk anymore that's Nicola Sturgeon first minister of Scotland for anybody who doesn't know uh, this has been a whole thing for a while now in Scottish politics I'm not going to go through the history of it suffice to say Alex Salmond is a wrong un, right? And anybody who supports that guy can eat a dick. Um, and his t- testament to that fact is the spectacle of all those now flocking around Alex Salmond, those leaving the SNP and those joining his party from other parties, all of whom are a bit shady and some of the more reactionary elements of the SNP anyway. And so you kind of look at it as... You know, I wasn't a huge fan of the SNP prior, but if they're going to get rid of all their worst elements, this is a win, if you ask me. Um, even the most kind of urgent SNP supporter would have probably looked at certain elements of the SNP and been like, could be a problem. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, a lot of people will forgive stuff purely for the case of Scottish the, independence. The SNP, you should say, actually, the SNP for a few years has had big problems, with, particularly with transphobia and misogyny. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... There have been a lot of people on the independence movement. One of the reasons I, be, I became really disillusioned with the independence movement generally in the last few years is because there are so many reactionary elements who are not really interested in a progressive independent Scotland. They are just interested in independence for the sake of independence. Uh, and these people are very loud, very brash, and very reactionary in their politics outside of independence. And unfortunately, they have a lot of followers and I'm, a lot of them have become kind of cult folk figures. I'm thinking of like your Reverend Stuart Whitsis-Tits, who goes by Wings Over Scotland, uh, Reverend Stuart Campbell. All that vocal fry and what everything. What a cunt! There's other similar personalities. A lot of those personalities are all now flocking around Salmon, and I'm sort of quite glad about that, because I'm hoping that it means they've got no chance of ever actually wielding power. Yeah, it's great to see the wheat being separated from the chaff uh, in the independence movement. So, turds of a feather. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I think uh, Alex Salmond, as as one of my friends, uh, Big Matt Evans, said earlier in the week, uh, Alex Salmond should have just called his new party No Nicholas Club. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're on a depressing kick anyway. Uh, um, Press F sobriety. Press F for Jessica Walter. Take a drink for Jessica Walter. Better known as Lucille Bluth from Arrested Development and as Mallory Archer from Archer. Absolutely brilliant as those characters were very similar. Every line that she says in either show is iconic. Just super gifable, all her stuff from Arrested Development. I mean, how much could a banana cost, Michael? Ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone needs me, I'll be in the hospital bar. <laughs> you know, there's no bars in hospitals. Well, that's why people don't like hospitals. <laughs> Great actors, rest in power. Have a drink. Have several drinks. Um, yeah. Who else died? Uh, also, Craig Mums Grant, uh, who is oh. a performance poet and also actor, best known probably for his work in the HBO drama Oz. 
as uh, the, both the narrator and poet. Yeah, he 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 seemed like a he always seemed like a top guy. Uh, he, he was always I remember watched so many interviews with him back when I was really obsessed with that show. Um, but he was like an actual slam poetry competitor for years and years. A uh, really talented guy, seemed like a really lovely human being, and his performance in that show is so, so good. And I enjoy seeing him. He's one of those actors I would enjoy seeing just pop up from time to time. I always thought it was a bit weird he never had a bigger career as an actor because he had a great screen presence in that show, in a show that was had no shortage of great screen presences. But yeah, I was very sad to learn that he died. I think he was, what, in his 50s? Early 50s? 52. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so sad. Take a drink for uh, Craig Mums Grant. And I guess that's it for another episode of Press F Sobriety. And now back to cheerier stuff. <laughs> Doodle pip. <laughs> Doodle pip. Uh, We'll get to Mr. Robot in a minute, guys. Guys, we are getting to Mr. Robot. We'll get to, we'll get to Fargo in a few minutes. That's a callback. Yeah, that's a callback to an, an important pivotal episode of this podcast history. Uh, only real fans understand. I think another thing that uh, I cannot let pass without commentary is uh, Lil Nas X this week. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I do. Lil Nas X. Who's always been... He's always seemed like a good one. Oh, for sure. On social media. Yeah. Yeah, like he's been—he's always been humble and hilarious, yeah. <laughs> regardless if you like or dislike Old Town Road. <laughs> I think Old Town Road is an irresistible bop. I don't know how anybody can not like that song. But over and above that, yeah, he seems like a really lovely human being. Uh, he's obviously good. he's a genuine creative force, uh, and he's someone who's clearly just loving his life and living his truth. And I'm 100% here for it. I'm principally here for the way in which he is trolling currently all the right people in all the right ways. He is the new Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so. According to a whole bunch of quote-unquote Christians, Lil Nas X is the embodiment of all things demonic. And it, it's incredible that in this day and age, an artist, all they have to do is employ the same, the same old hat Christian, Judeo-Christian imagery uh, of hell and demons and somehow that's enough to get people upset. But of course, that's not what's getting people upset. What's getting these people upset, particularly, is that Lil Nas X is a young gay black man, and he's living his truth, and these people just want to find a way to intellectualize their own homophobia. And all of these people, they don't give a fuck about their religion at any other time, except when they can use it as an excuse to bolster their own bigotry. And that's exactly what they're doing here. And I'm absolutely loving the way that Lil Nas X, who this past week has been an absolute superstar on social media, <laughs> uh, is just getting them to cry the saltiest tears and just absolutely loving his own life at the moment. And I am here for it. It's, it's the feel-good story of the past week. <laughs> It's always great. I love seeing musicians use the Satanism trope because it just it never ceases <laughs> to wind up the Christian right. It's astonishing that something that's essentially just pantomime imagery can still have that impact. If I was um, Lil Nas X, I would be putting backwards messages on my records <laughs> and shit now. I'd be going the full hog. Yeah, it's great, it's great stuff. Uh, Shout out to Lil Nas X. Cheers to Lil Nas X. Uh, <laughs> he's a good one. <laughs> Alright, so before we finally crack on, uh, to Mr. Robot. I just want to give a bit of music news. A quick shout out to a band called Sisters of Suffocation who have been digging for a couple of years, uh, who are a uh, largely female death metal band from the Netherlands. Wait, James, is this. Death metal? Hmm. Is this an episode of Riff Sobriety, the podcast in which we discuss all things metal? I think it might be, Craig, so with that in mind, roll let's the music. music. <laughs> <laughs> A very elegant intro. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to Riff Sobriety, the podcast in which we do that thing I just said. James, so are you familiar with Sisters of Suffocation? Or as Sean Connery would say, Sisters of Suffocation. Sisters of Suffocation. Shamweet Sisters of Suffocation. I put a smattering of Sisters of Suffocation in the playlist I made yep. you for your birthday last year, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I have some familiarity. Yeah, so, well, I, I might make you a bit more familiar for, uh, for the purpose of the podcast in just a second, but uh, the reason I mention it is they have just, they have recently completed their new album, which they recorded during lockdown in 2020. 
they are struggling to get funds together to actually release the album and do it all properly and obviously these days they cannot perform live which would be their main revenue stream as is the case with most artists these days so they've put up a crowdfunder so if anybody wants to throw some money their way I've already done so uh, if you're a fan of quality metal and you particularly like uh, groups of women being badass in metal uh, you, you won't be disappointed if you're not familiar with them they are a great band and uh, their first two albums are both stellar and I'm pretty sure this next one will be also so I'll put a link to the crowdfunder uh, if anybody's interested in doing that uh, in order to service that we might as well give the listeners a taste and yourself also James I'm going to send you a wee link here check this out ram it in your lugs ram it in my lugs let's get the sisters of suffocation some of that sweet sweet youtube revenue that we so desperately (laughs) never get that's a track called shapeshifter and this is one of their earlier tracks back when they were only a shapeshifter shapeshifter yes this is from back when they were just a four piece they are now a five piece um so the sound has uh, evolved a bit since this, but this gives you some idea of what they're all about. Give that a wee spin, see what you think. I'm going to press play now. That's how it works. When you press the button, as uh, Trudy would say, it's Steel Mountain. <laughs> a lot of drumming going on here. <laughs> yeah, I figured that would get you. So this is quite uh, raw and basic compared to the stuff they do. The stuff they do now is a bit more technical. Um, because they have expanded to a five-piece. The second guitarist that they expanded with, she's like a very technical jazz guitarist. Oh. Uh, so after you've, after you've appreciated this one, I'll chuck another one your way and you can see how the sound has changed slightly. Uh, how are you digging so they're, it? So they're from the Netherlands? Indeed, yes. Uh, yes, playing the death metal. <laughs> That's Play. definitely how they talk in yeah, the Netherlands. Sur- surrounded by the Meat Hooks. The Meat Hooks, uh, my favourite hardcore punk band from DC in the early 80s. My favourite go-go band. <laughs> yes. It's pretty jamming. Yep. I do love trying to guess the number of strings on a death metal guitarist's guitar. Is it yes. seven? Is it eight? Yeah. There's some ribs. We're having got, ribs. Got ribs. <laughs> some grinding and pounding going on here. Yeah, it, it veers just on the cusp of metalcore. Um, but I mean, I, I couldn't tell you the discernible difference between death metal and metalcore, honestly. I, I get really? lost when you get into those <laughs> changes, yeah. If, well, if it's, it, it, it would be it, the difference between uh, Rolo Tomasi and Napalm Death. Uh, <laughs> Although right. Napalm Death, admittedly, are more grindcore, but... I just assume stuff's death metal or thrash metal. Yeah, I, I, I don't get too hung up on the differences, but yeah. I'm just throwing it in there for for those of you who are. If they've got some vampy makeup on, it's black metal. Right, yes, that's how it works. I, I, I'm, about, I'm, I'm about to get a bit, actually, there is generally <laughs> more dissonance in black metal, and you know it, it tends to focus less on the chunk and more on the dissonance. That's how I describe guitar sounds. <laughs> Less chunk, more dissonance. Less chunk, more dissonance. There's the episode title. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I sent you a second one there. This is from their more recent album. This is All with right. this is with their bolstered lineup with the second guitarist. They, the guitar work is slightly more technical. Their first guitarist, though, she Emily, she is the one who does most of the social media stuff, and she just seems like the sweetest human being. Ah, they're also on Napalm Records, or yes, used yeah. to be on Napalm, right? Yeah, no, I believe they still are, I think. But yeah, Napalm Records has, seems to have no shortage of uh, badass, all female or near all female death metal lineups. I mean, Napalm's roster is, is intense. They're yeah, one it's of, generally like, pretty good. Yeah. They're one of the, like, the last standing big metal labels, yeah. and it's always good to see that <laughs> come up at the start of a video. It is, yeah. It's quite Shout satisfying. out to Napalm Records. You know you're in good hands. <laughs> okay, pressing play. This is The Machine by Sisters of Suffocation. Yeah, Sisters of Suffocation with The Machine. Take right touch. <laughs> I like that the typing on the keyboard here 
is kind of mimicking the double bass drum. Yeah, it is a bit, yeah. There, I see what you mean about the, the more technical guitaring going on here. Mm -hmm. I'm now trying to look and see how many strings she has. <laughs> so yeah, how is that? Uh, how is that stirring your uh, fondness for your so gen our mutual general fondness for badass ladies and metal? Yep, it's good. It's it's not doing anything to dull it. This is a really well, good tune. No, certainly not. Yep. So yeah, that's another band for you to check out when you've uh, you've got a minute. And uh, for the listeners who enjoy this kind of thing. Get them doing it and support them by the crowdfunder. Get that new album out. Uh, it's it's going to be worth it. Yeah, like I say, we'll put a link in the description. Whilst we're within this episode of Riff Sobriety, I also want to bring up another band I've just realised I've not mentioned in the podcast before. It's a band called Crypt Crawler. Uh, now, James, brace yourself. You might not believe what I'm about to say next. Are they an all-female metal band? No. What? There's, there's no women in this band. I'm sorry. Are you telling me like there's, there's space let, for men in Riff Sobriety? <laughs> it turns out, yeah. When did the men get their day in the sun? It turns out it's today. <laughs> Finally. Uh, they're from uh, Australia, uh, and they are legitimately one of the best death metal bands I've heard in a long while. Uh, I've, I first came across them just a few months ago, just randomly. I think it may have been one of those things where I'd left a Spotify playlist uh, just playing in the background, and then it exhausted the playlist and then started playing stuff that was related. Uh, and then this band came out of nowhere, and I was like, holy shit, what is this? This is amazing. This riff work is intense. Um, I'm going to send you a wee link here. This is Vengeance for the Unborn by Cryptcrawler. This is just like good, meaty, old school death metal. Very much in the vein uh, of like early death, um, early morbid angel, that sort of vibe. The guy's voice is so good. Uh, the good thing about this video as well, it, it's, it's a very basic quote unquote as live uh, on stage type video. Uh, mm. And so you really see the guitar is shredding and it's quite good fun. Cryptcrawler, crikey. Hang on a second. Cryptcrawler have 81 subscribers. Yeah. Do you know what I'm going to... Uh, excuse me <laughs> while I... While I uh, if, just in case anyone's listening to this on YouTube, why don't you do what I'm about to do here for Cryptcrawler and hit that subscribe button. Get them up to 100 subscribers so they can get their custom YouTube URL. Like we want. Why not come yes. along to search for F Sobriety, give us a subscribe, and then we'll be able to have the Hamiltron actually tell you to check out youtube.com forward slash F Sobriety. Absolutely, and that's what we all want. That's the future. That's the, that's the future that liberals want. <laughs> all right, I've subscribed to Cryptcrawler, and I'm pressing play on Vengeance for the Unborn. The drummer's face. Hilarious <laughs> while he's doing those blast beats because that's like the face I would do while being unable to play them. <laughs> I will say, right, and I don't know whether this is just because I'm a cis het male, but there's something about watching a bunch of men do this that's not as fun. <laughs> I mean, I, I would just rather watch, you know, cis of suffocation or, uh, or nervosa do this kind of stuff, uh, but hey, you can't have everything. I don't know, I think there's something to be said for a bunch of. Like guys with like long hair, and just, like five Aquaman. <laughs> yeah, five slightly less muscular Aquaman. But it turns out guys can do this stuff too. Who knew? One up for the Brotherhood, I guess. How you enjoyed it? This is pretty good. I'm into it. Yeah, but it's very old school. It's not adding much new to the formula, but hey, if it ain't broken, all that. It's doing the thing I like, where there's like a heavy double bass riff but with mm -hmm. uh, um, a nice syncopated red cymbal bell pattern to kind of vary right, up uh, the feel. Lana de Metal uses that idea of the syncopated red cymbal bell a lot to vary up the kind yes, of da -da 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 rhythms. Yeah. Shout out to Lana de Metal. We heart Luana. I like that there's a certain tempo of metal, right, mm -hmm. that people play where the guitarists have to just sort of stand really still because there's nothing you can really do to move that <laughs> fast. Right, yes, yeah. I will literally destroy my body if I attempt to emulate this yeah. rhythm. So here you go, that's an upvote from me. Good stuff. Listeners, look up Cryptcrawler Vengeance for the Unborn on YouTube. Or if you need any of their other stuff, it's all good. They've got an EP and one album out so far, uh, and all the tracks are pretty solid. Subscribe on YouTube, let's be the podcast that gets Cryptcrawler over 100 subscribers. Yep, yeah, let's spread the love and hope it comes back to us. <laughs> 
so before we dispense with this episode of uh, Riff Sobriety, I just wanted to make a quick mention, a couple of mentions. Uh, you are already aware of it, James, but I just want to mention it anyway. Diva Satanica released her a vocal playthrough video of her performing under runes. <laughs> it's so cool. Uh, if it, you ever want to see shoulder bops like a boss, watch that video. <laughs> Infinite heart eyes emojis. But I, I love that she's just so calm and cool and she makes it look easy. Yep. Despite the torture she's clearly putting her vocal cards through. Crypta today also dropped a, uh, dropped a tease for their first music video. So it looks like it's going to drop within the next week, I think. Or at the end of the month. No, we It'll probably be tomorrow. Might be tomorrow. <laughs> That's what will happen, James. Since yep. we've just done an episode of Riffs Friday, um, it'll be the next day. I cannot explain how excited I am for that band to just be unleashed. I'm so stoked for it. Um, it's going to be so great to hear and see Fernanda and Luana do stuff together again. And the fact they have Sonia and Taina, who are s- both amazing shredding guitarists, I'm so excited about what they're going to come out with. I've got a feeling it's just going to destroy the world in the best, most beautiful way. And we'll be definitely covering that on another episode of Riff Sobriety when it happens. We sure will. But until then... Keep on rocking. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Yes, we are in our 40s. Uh, And that's been another episode of Riff Sobriety. Toodle pair. Good app. Good app. Good meaty app. All right, so uh, I think it's just one thing, one more thing I want to mention before we dive into the Mr. Robot territory. Uh, as mentioned on this podcast frequently, uh, even on this very episode, James, you know what to drop. I'll do a bit of reading, me. Well, looks like we got ourselves a reader. Thanks, Bill. Uh, <laughs> thanks, unnamed waitress. So. Another thing I did, believe it or not, I did have time to do this during the 48 hours I had no broadband. Not only watched the entirety of Twin Peaks The Return, I also read an entire novel in one sitting. I know I, know, I did not get much sleep, uh, but I read a novel called Earth Eater by Dolores Reyes, which whew, is one of the best things I've read in a long time. Dolores Reyes is an Argentine writer. This, I believe, is her only novel so far, and I was not aware of her at all. I only ordered this book because uh, I heard another couple of writers talking about it, one of them being uh, Sylvia Moreno Garcia, in fact, who I've talked about on this podcast before, uh, and Miriam Gurba, who I've also talked about on this podcast. They both raved about it, and I thought, okay, that's going to be worth checking out. It's so unlike anything I've read, and yet somehow uh, so completely necessary to the moment we're currently, uh, you know, imprisoned in, if you want to look at it that way. In a nutshell, it's a story about a woman in an unnamed kind of slum area in Argentina who finds herself suddenly drawn to eating the earth, and after she does this a few times, she realises that she is beginning to have visions about people who are either dead or whose lives are somehow being kind of uh, broken in some way. And the first time she does it, she learns the truth about her own mother's death, uh, something she had wondered about for quite some time. It had been a source of a lot of turmoil in her life. And she realizes the more she eats dirt. We'll have a dirt feast! The more she has visions about other people's deaths or other people's uh, ordeals and over the course of the story she kind of becomes a kind of celebrity and people start to go to her looking for information on their own dead loved ones or lost loved ones it's a really surreal very haunting story the way it's written is in very spare kind of prose but it's that beautiful kind of spare that somehow it's just the right amount of words are chosen it's the right words that are chosen I should probably give a shout out to Julia Sanchez the translator because she does an amazing job with what I can only think is conveying the real spirit of Dolores Reyes's work but it's kind of a mixture of magical realism surrealism and horror and if any of those things are up your alley I highly recommend it it's a shortish novel I mean it's like 230 pages or so uh, but I as I said found it utterly unput downable Uh, extremely spellbinding stuff and I'm really excited to see what she does next it's got a very very crucial modern feminist perspective uh, but it's one that creeps up on you it's not out there loud uh, and brash with it Uh, not that I would have cared if it had been nice save there 
it's <laughs> but it's it's imbued into the narrative in uh, a very natural uh, and unexpected way because uh, the story does go to a very dark place very quickly uh, and you know there's a lot of complicated conversations about the uh, out there amongst academics and literary specialists and whatnot about what constitutes feminism and how feminism should be approached in literature it's an incredible book it's very thought provoking uh, and there's just certain imagery and certain f- uh, phrasings in it that are going to stick with me for a long time uh, so cannot praise it enough uh, and if that sounds like your bag, it definitely will be. Link in the description. Yep. Uh, I've got one more thing to say. Yes. I've talked about it before in the podcast. The Dungeon Run have got the rights to their show back from Caffeine.tv. They mm-hmm. have a Twitch channel now, which is oh. twitch.tv forward slash the Dungeon Run. And as of recording, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, um, for US listeners, obviously you're not going to get it for the first episode but uh, <laughs> 6 p.m pacific standard time the dungeon run is back on twitch.tv slash the dungeon run so i'm a big proponent of it if they're if you're a fan of long form storytelling in general but of especially done by role-playing games i cannot recommend it highly enough check it out it's great uh twitch.tv slash the dungeon run wish those guys all the best i'm gonna stay up till stupid late tomorrow night and watch it live sweet uh, really happy that they got it back because for a while there it looked like it was it was done. Well, I'm happy for you. Glad it's back. <laughs> I've got a wee thing. I'm just going to provide as a segue here into our uh, bar break because yeah. I think we deserve a bar break before we dive into I Mr. Boba. Uh, but uh, a musical interlude, if you will. <laughs> I just want to mention the funniest thing I saw this week online. You know, probably away from Lil Nas X's tweets. Um, I forget who posted it. And I don't know who the the original author of it was, but it was a TikTok video of a young woman (laughs) who introduces herself just by saying, here's a weird talent nobody asked for, after which she proceeds to do what I can only describe as the uncanniest impersonation by a human voice of a trumpet I am ever likely to hear in all my days. And when she says talent... It's a serious talent. I would pay to go see this. I would. I would. She should get a gig at the Blue Arrow in Glasgow, supporting like Sons of Kem or something. I would go see that shit. Uh, there's a part in it where she actually uses a drinking glass as a mute, and it literally just sounds like a muted trumpet. Uh, simultaneously hilarious and wonderful. And I'm, it's moments like that. I'm so glad the internet exists. <laughs> All right. Anyway, my round. I think so. We'll be right back after this message. drinking Craig? Well, James I'm going to shock you yeah, not for the first time in this episode oh really this is the second consecutive podcast episode we've recorded in which I'm not drinking wine what are you drinking take a guess are you drinking slavery apologist green king's east coast <laughs> IPA <laughs> let's just reiterate they're the good kind of slavery apologist. apologizing for slavery <laughs> in their company's past <laughs> I am yes I'm drinking the old east coast IPA the Tron Bar fave shout out to the Tron Bar not the Hamilton. the other one with. it's funny you mention that Craig because would you Adam and Eva <gasps> I'm drinking the good kind of slavery apologist green king brewery were available for um, sponsorship <laughs> deals East Coast IPA. Get in. How about that? This is literally like being back at the it train. It really is. Uh, except, with, except with all the stuff that implies being back at the train. None of the ambience. <laughs> no ambience, no staff. Oh. The pleasant bar staff, of course. We love you, bar staff. We hope you all still have your jobs after this nightmare we've all been collectively living under. Uh, we hope to see you as soon as possible. Yeah, we're going to hug. <laughs> when we see you, we're going to hug you. <laughs> I'm going to hug you just as soon as I'm finished giving myself an injury by somersaulting in like coked up Nicolas Cage circa 1990 on his appearance in Wogan. But you know what we used to do when we sat in the Tron Craig? What's that, James? We used to talk about Mr. Robot. Oh, you're right. And here we are at the end of season one. 
the climax of season one, if you will. Can you believe we finally made it to the end of a whole season of Mr. Robot for the purposes of this podcast? They said it wouldn't be done, James. And they had no faith. They were wrong, because here we are at Mr. Robot. Season one, episode ten. Zero day dot AVI. Written, directed by Sam Esmail. Get used to that credit from here on in. Yep, you may know Sam Esmail from his work on Mr. Robot. And indeed Homecoming. And the little scene independent comedy movie, Comet. <laughs> you also may know his name from another source, but we'll come to that shortly. In a fact that I have about this episode. Oh, well now I'm stoked. Stoked for facts. A zero day exploit, Craig. It's a cyber mm-hmm. attack which occurs on the same day that a weakness is discovered in a piece of software and it's okay. the exploit happens before a fix can be made. Gotcha. This episode, Craig, originally aired on the 2nd of September 2015. Mm-hmm. It was originally slated to air on August 26th, but was delayed mm-hmm. by a week by USA Networks due to the shooting that day live on air of WDBJ Virginia journalists Alison Parker and Adam Ward by wow. a former anchor, Vester Lee Flanagan, who filmed the killings and posted them on Facebook, as well as the killings being broadcast live on the news program. Holy shit, I've never heard this before. Yep, given James Plouffe's suicide in the episode, yeah, yeah. Um, USA Network didn't want to air it that day. Wow, that's... Okay, yeah, well that makes sense. Uh, yep. uh, yeah, I've never heard that before. Me neither, I was looking up facts. Vester Lee Flanagan later killed himself that day. I was actually going to bring up, and we were getting ahead of ourselves here slightly with the James Plough suicide, but since you just brought it up, that scene always gives me big uh, Robert Bud Dwyer energy. That was one of the first horrible things I saw on the internet. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, for anybody who doesn't know, Robert Bud Dwyer was a politician. Was it Pennsylvania? I think it was Pennsylvania. It was late 80s, 87 or so. Yep. But yeah, he literally did commit suicide uh, live on television in front of a news conference. Uh, and there's a whole complicated story behind that, which is very... It's one of those grim, but also sort of weirdly fascinating moments in history where there's such a complex story behind all of that stuff that it, it's actually worth reading up into if, you, if you're if you into that sort of thing. And I don't mean it in a ghoulish kind of way, it's just an interesting story. I don't know if it still is because I've not looked for it, but the video was on the internet and it's, yeah, it's yeah. fucking horrible. I watched it back in the day when the internet was new and shiny and you could look at horrible things and be like, <laughs> what? Yeah, not like now, when it's now just a salubrious endless <laughs> meadow of uh, goodwill and, and joy and positive feeling. Yep. All right, well, moving on. <laughs> so we begin with... Quote-unquote Michael, <laughs> Michael meets up slash with Krista. Lenny. Yeah. And Michael at continues this. to be the worst from the word go. Mm. They meet up at Pierre Loti, this swish looking restaurant and yeah real name Lenny and uh, I feel bad because any time I hear the name Lenny it just makes me think of the Simpsons and uh, this guy is least like Lenny from the Simpsons Lenny from the Simpsons doesn't deserve having the same name as this guy yeah, so Michael slash Lenny has managed to get uh, Krista to come and meet him under the false pretense that he's dying yeah it's like this guy goes from bad to worse it's like what this was the only thing you could think of to get to come and meet you this is low buddy <laughs> to which her response is when she finds out <laughs> you're a sick motherfucker yeah and we're like, all yeah, go, go Krista <laughs> yeah and she says don't call me again even when you are dying which I think is my favourite line in this scene but Lenny tells her about being hacked by Elliot. Uh, he's got the file from the police showing that Elliot took Flipper to the vet. As previously mentioned in one of our podcasts, I did make a note saying that will be important later. And the police have been looking for Elliot, but they've not been able to get him down because essentially uh, it's difficult to kind of charge anybody for this sort of stuff uh, when they're as careful as Elliot is. As, as Lenny, I was about to call him Michael, fucking Michael, fuck you Lenny, as Lenny goes on to detail. But Lenny says to Krista, he's certifiable. He's seen you, so he must be. It's like, dude, you're not doing a great job here of ingratiating yourself in this situation. So he tells her that Elliot made him break up with her. Now, he mentions the Ashley Madison leak here. Now, can you refresh my memory? Was the Ashley Ma- Did the Ashley Madison leak happen in real life prior to this, or was this that was this an Esmail uh, precognition? The, no, this is an anachronism. This episode, like I said, was supposed to air 26th of August, but aired the 2nd of September 2015. Mm-hmm. But this episode is taking place on 5-9, so in May 2015. The Ashley Madison breach happened in July 2015 and the right, data okay. dump was released in August 2015 so in the timeline of Mr. Robot 
this hasn't technically happened, but it had happened obviously as he was writing the episode. So it presumably right, okay, has included okay. it to anchor it in that time frame. Gotcha, okay. One of the names, Craig, that was released in the Ashley Madison hack would be familiar to viewers of Mr. Robot. Go on. Sam Esmail's name was among those released really? in the Ad- Ashley Madison hack. Sam Esmail... Uh, okay, how do I not know this? Okay, here's the thing. Sam Esmail <laughs> claims to have... I think this was put in possibly as a deliberate joking self own. Ishmael said that he joined Ashley Madison in order to research the character of Michael slash Lenny to find out how someone could have a bunch of affairs and then be found out by a hacker. Gotcha, okay. However, it's got slight I mean I it's fully believable because Ishmael does his research, but it's also got Townsend, Townsend, where's the book energy? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, I was thinking that, yeah. Uh, for anyone who's unfamiliar, <laughs> uh, yeah. Pete Townsend from The Who was caught yeah. with child pornography on his computer and claimed he was researching a book on paedophiles, uh, but never released a book. Uh, but he got off with the charges, so mm. uh, has been chanted at, at concerts. Um, subsequently, Townsend, Townsend, where's the book? <sighs> Moving anyway, on. So that's where, that was my, <laughs> that's where you'll have heard Sam Esmail's name. <laughs> That's where I know him from. <laughs> uh, Michael slash Lenny is is baffled because they can't find uh, Elliot because he's routing through proxies or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, proxies or something, yes. Yeah. Uh, through uh, Estonia, it turns out, yep. and short of that country falling apart, they're never going to get this guy. <laughs> that might be important later. Check off Estonia. So he needles Krista for info on Elliot. Uh, he's insistent Elliot deserves to go to jail. Because he ruined Michael slash Lenny's life, even though his wife then subsequently discovered all his affairs. But yeah. he's, he's insisting that he deserves to go to jail because he stole my dog. <laughs> yes, the asshole stole my dog. Yeah. He tells uh, Krista not to give him any of that privileged information bullshit. And then mm-hmm. says, come on, remember the good times we had here? Yeah, we had a good thing. Yeah, I really loved you. Yes, yes, yeah. Self own there, Lenny. Yeah. Uh, and so Krista quite rightly tells him, "Never, to- Elliot never told her anything. Get out of here. Fuck you, Lenny." So Lenny returns home like a complete sad sack with his McDonald's. Uh, clearly not a happy meal. Um, <laughs> flicks on the news, and it's all the five nine hack. And so this gets this is our first confirmation that the five nine hack has happened. And. Among the things the newsreader is saying is that certain Eastern European countries have been completely destabilised. Among them, would you, Adam and Eva, is Estonia. Yeah, that's what catches Lenny slash Michael's attention. Do you find this a bit on the nose or is it fine? I enjoy the on the noseness of it. See, I quite enjoy it as well, right? But it is, I, I'm totally aware as I'm saying that, that if this was in another show that wasn't as in the main as well written as Mr. Robot is it's the kind of thing I would have a problem with I say alright mate you fucking flash put a neon flashlight on that one it's like we get it okay you did not have to say Estonia twice you know well if Estonia falls apart next scene Estonia has fallen apart like come on that is clumsy writing and even here I think it is clumsy writing but (sighs) it's fine (laughs) I enjoyed it I enjoyed it I think it's great lampshading (laughs) There's something about it in this show, it just works. I, um, yeah, fuck it, it's fine. <laughs> yep. We get the needle drop, world destruction by time zone. Which is a banger, uh, even though I have all sorts of negative associations with John Lydon's voice. See, here's the uh, thing. I have also, like, John Lydon is like a kind of shit hawk, but this will not be the only needle drop in this show of John Lydon's voice that works incredibly well with the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, season 2 where it has uh, The Order of Death by Public Image Yes, limited. that is a really great use of that song yeah. in that scene. Yeah. So it's the only time I will listen to John Lydon's voice is yeah. when Sam Esmail decides it fits the scene. I will admit, when I was younger, I did really like Pill. Uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on in their early records, but I, I don't know if I could ever listen to them again now. Um, but anyway, that's a whole separate conversation. But yeah, World Destruction is a great choice, a needle drop here. I love that we get it, the chorus blasting just as the title card comes over the footage of the protest. That image alone, just that title card, is one that really stays with me whenever I think of the show. It's one of the most iconic ones, I think. Uh, it really sums up the mood of the show. This is the point in the episode where we realise, oh shit, the hack's happened. The hack has literally happened. Did we miss an episode? Yeah. So the music drip abruptly cuts off. As Elliot wakes up in the back of Terrell's SUV. 
wondering where the fuck he is and how the fuck he got there. There's the most hapless parking attendant on earth, as he, he will come to be revealed to us in season two, needs more money, and apparently Elliot has been here for at least two days and his money is run out. Elliot asks us, what do you remember? And then he says, no way, I don't even trust you, so uh, we're in the bad books. The parking attendant tells him he needs cash because yeah. the credit card systems went down. Yeah, so this is for real. It's really happened. This, the the uh, the gears of corporate capitalism have been ground to not quite a halt, but uh, certainly it's a spanner thrown in. So it's cash from here on in. Elliot somewhat confusedly stumbles away from the car. Yeah. Leaving that iconic I love New York Frank Sinatra. Mural, yeah, that's mural great. Background. <laughs> Meanwhile. Meanwhile, <laughs> Angela is take a drink, everyone. Paranoid on a train. <laughs> She's making her way to Evil Core for work. Of all the weeks that she could start working for Evil Core. I get the impression from this that she's been there, just had to go home, shower, change and come back like she's been pulling in all night or because she looks mm. frazzled. And she looks walk of shamed. And the woman she speaks to when she comes in says, where have you been? She says, oh, I had to go and shower and change. And the woman says, oh, you're still new here. <laughs> yeah. Elsewhere in Coney Island, F Society are doing the get the klaxon ready. It's wipe down time. <laughs> I've got it down here in capital letters. It's the big wipe down. <laughs> Yeah. Elliot turns up as they're in full wipe down mode. Romero is not best pleased with Elliot. Uh, he was pretty clear that they should have all executed this plan together. Darlene is insisting that Elliot had his reasons and says anyway it worked, so lighten up Romero. However, Darlene is upset with Elliot in private, away from the rest of the group, and she confirms here that he's been gone for three days. Yeah. So Elliot now realises that the hack went through, and Darlene tells him that there's been protests all over the city, there's people who want to join F Society, so it's really happened, it's gone mainstream. Yeah, she says it went like gangbusters. <laughs> Elliot heads to computer to check. We get the echoey keystrokes as he catches up in the news, uh, and I, I love the uh, close-ups on the, the phrase, potentially lethal. Yeah. It's so good. Darlene leans in kind of concerned because it's apparent that Elliot doesn't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And she says, are you still seeing him? Referring Mr. Robot in case anyone's... Yeah. Or, <laughs> in, case, in, case, in case you've got what show you're watching. Yeah. Um, and he says no. So uh, to us he says, but I need to. Mm -hmm. And she says to Darlene, I told you we shouldn't have done this. Which is a uh, bit of a, a shitty thing to say to Darlene when he did it. <laughs> right, yes. When I... <laughs> Which is why I did it, so yeah. that we wouldn't do it. It was presumably the rest of his sentence. Meanwhile, at All Safe... Gideon's having a totally normal one. So Gideon's part-time CFO is telling him that he has to close the company, which we all knew was coming eventually, but this this particular incident has just accelerated the process. Uh, yeah, Gideon's really having a normal one. She runs all the costs out and says, you're going to have to close down, and he says... Maybe we can uh, we can get through this. We can just buy some time. And she's like, yes, hi. It's, it's got big. Can you check again? Energy. Yeah. But he's saying that ever since the company started, he feels he's been rearranging deck chairs. That their conversations are always depressing. This scene really encapsulates for me, like a, 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 what I think the truth is for a lot of kind of medium level businesses, which is what All Safe is, despite having as a client the world's biggest corporate conglomerate. They don't see really the benefit of having that as their client because really all it gives them is stress to always deliver when they don't actually have the correct resources a lot of the time. This scene does bring it home to me just how miserable Gideon's existence must have been for these past few years. Like he must have just been stressed out his tits constantly. Yeah. It's surprised the guy ever sleeps, to be honest. His CFO says, I'm in charge of the numbers, it's always going to be a depressing conversation. <laughs> yeah. She tells Gideon that he should let his employees know as soon as possible so that they can find other jobs. Uh, oh, and by the way, the kicker here, all the employees' pensions are tied up with Evil Core, so uh, Tom from Tom and Jerry Shrug, gif. Yep. On the plus side, however, she has, F Society have ensured that they'll have no debt, so that's a plus. <laughs> Cut to our man Elliot, heading to Ecore himself. It's like a celebration circus music. It's got big circus energy, yeah. It's like a weird, dark, celebratory circus energy. It's everything's falling apart around him. It adds a very surreal comic tone to all these people around him having a meltdown. Elliot here at this point is wondering why Terrell let this happen, and it, he assumed that leading Terrell to Fun Society would mean that Terrell would attempt to stop him. And he, he muses about the fact that the malware that Darlene put together it took two hours to put that together and he says two hours that's all it takes to destroy the world uh, and he says i should be enjoying this why am i looking for terrell 
So at this point, it's interesting at this point in the episode, because I always forget this because we're, we're all, in retrospect, we're aware of where the story goes. But there is this moment where he doesn't know where Terrell is, and we as the audience didn't know at this point. Uh, and of course, we don't know for a long time where Terrell mm-hmm. is. Uh, but it, the big running thing in season two is that Elliot comes to believe that he's somehow responsible for Terrell's death. Um, but yeah, it's interesting, there's this window here which is just like, oh, maybe Terrell will turn up soon. <laughs> But Elliot muses about all these elites kidding themselves that they can fix this. We get great stock footage of various world leaders of the time and various political figures, corporate figures. This is something that Sam Esmail will start to use more and more in the show. Yeah, there's more, and it's certainly season four. There's there's a good amount of this. Uh, I really find this stuff exciting. I love when the when the show does this. Uh, it when it adds that real world element, it's just so much fun. Yeah, Elliot says that Darlene used 256 bit AES encryption. And it will take them an unfathomable length of time to decrypt it. I looked up 256-bit AES encryption. I'm not going to lie, didn't understand anything that I was reading because, <laughs> as we've mentioned before, I'm not a computer guy. You're not. We a are not guy. tech guys. But no. What I got from reading about it is that 256-bit AES is impossible to decrypt. Well, that's fair. Yeah. That ch- that checks, it checks out. out. That's a fact. <laughs> Catches up with her favourite secretary, Elizabeth, uh, who tells Elliot that Terrell no longer works here. Uh, and then we're interrupted by another classic F Society video. And, of course, on screen we now hear that it's Elliot's own voice yep. uh, coming from the screen. It's a bit like Mr. Robot here is also telling Elliot that he's been owned, <laughs> which I sort of quite like. Um, but certainly he's delivering the message to Ecor. You've been owned. We will. Sm- Some of the dialogue here is so good. Yep. And it's interesting we hear this because I can easily imagine this dialogue here being perfectly delivered by Christian Slater. Absolutely. But here here we get it delivered by Rami Malek. And Rami, to his credit, is doing his best Slater impression in terms of this delivery. Where he says, we will smile as we watch you and your dark souls die. (laughs) Your debt has been forgiven by your friends at F Society. Any money you owe these pigs has been forgiven. (laughs) It's great stuff. Uh, and I love the footage we get of all the people in like Times Square and all the streets looking up at the screens uh, with their masks on, their F Society masks. The opening bell of Wall Street will be the death knell of Evil Core. That's a great, it's a great line. It says, we are finally free, we are finally awake. And the protesters cheer. Some of these shots are just so great. Uh, the, just the cinematic quality of some of those shots is amazing. And we talk about this a lot, but the angle of some of those shots is so weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we've seen, how many times do uh, do we see crowd shots in movies on city streets? You see it all the time. None of them look like this. The camera angles on these shots are just also are all just a bit off kilter and a bit odd. That lends this weirdly, paradoxically, a kind of unreal aspect that ultimately serves to make it real because it's so foreign to the language we normally the visual language we normally see this stuff being portrayed with meanwhile james pluff is having a totally normal one <laughs> james pluff yeah executive vice president for tech for ecor he's prepping for a tv interview james i don't know if you know but that guy really needs his bag where's his bag james his bag have you got his bag he needs where's his, his bag? bag it's got all that his, guy needs his bag it's got man. all his notes in it what do you think's in the bag? Do you think something's important in the bag? It might come into play later. I love that he's freaking out. His bag's literally next to him. <laughs> but uh, he does this thing where... The show does this from time to time, but he apologises for snapping it. It's another instance of the show presenting these people as being human and not just being, you know, kind of cardboard cut-out villains. Because as much as James Pluff is instrumental in what is ultimately an edifice that shouldn't really exist and really is a force for wrong in the world. He, uh, like Terry Colby and all the rest, he's still ultimately a guy who goes home at night and uh, you know has a wife probably, has children uh, or whatever he has at home. He has a regular life as he has this human part of him. It's like, oh, I'm sorry I snapped. Yeah. You know? And it's interesting he's having that moment here even when he knows he's about to kill himself. Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting human moment, and this is the only scene we get with this character. Uh, and full credit to this actor; he does a great job of imbuing all those kind of uh, contradictions in this very short uh, couple of scenes we get. I think like the actor does a great job here of having that sort of panicked, angry, scared corporate guy, just like knowing that he's going to die. The change, yeah. especially in the, the later scene in the interview, where he changes from being corporate spokesman to just giving it up. 
is yeah, incredible. Yeah. Really great work by that actor. Yeah, it's a great transition. Uh, we'll come on that in a moment, though, because meanwhile... Here are, in a row, <laughs> two of my favourite scenes in the entire series back-to-back, -back, and I love yeah. it. The, the sheer joy of the following scene is just... <laughs> it just it fills my heart with with joy and gladness. So this is our introduction of the puppy oven guy. Now I don't know what they've got in this guy. <laughs> I don't know why he's so willing to just not ask any questions. I mean, they hand uh, him a bunch of cash. So I, they hand him a bunch of cash. It's true, but uh, and, and I guess he's I guess he's confident enough that all the evidence will be destroyed that it's not going to be traced back to him. So he's the one guy in New York City at the moment who, is, who absolutely 100% knows what F society looked like uh, if he's got two brain cells and could put two and two together. But, uh, yeah. Um, I like Darling's musing here, which is, if you don't want to put puppies out their misery, you don't have to. Which I think it, this is one of two instances in this episode that shows us that Darlene is slightly short-sighted. Because I think it also perhaps commenting on her own situation a little bit. Um, Darlene is entering this space where, on the one hand, as we've discussed in the previous couple of episodes, she has reached this uh, plateau where she's a bit more very much fervently behind the political mission of F Society. But in a way, she's kind of romantically idealizing it and she's not fully thinking through the consequences. And I think that comes through in this statement here because... She's kind of ignoring the fact that as long as we all live under capitalism, a lot of us just don't have any choice but to do jobs that we're kind of lumped with. Uh, not everyone can afford to just ditch their job and find something better. It just doesn't always happen that way. Uh, and I do feel like that comment kind of speaks to that. But it's also why I think the guy will just take the money and not ask questions. He's a guy whose only job that he's able to get is cremating dead puppies, so, you know... If these people come and say, can we use your oven to dispose of some evidence? He's like, fuck yeah. My boss is at the bank. This is clearly he's going to be there a while. Mobley does have one of my favourite lines here of the episode <laughs> in this scene where they just chuck all the stuff in. Mobley says, I've run all the scenarios of a re little revolution here, but using a dead puppy oven was not on my list. <laughs> <laughs> needle drop. People who die, Jim Carroll band. It's a great needle drop. Yeah. It's a great montage song as they chuck all the stuff in, get it all flamed up. And then, of course, and by the way, no, I note that Trenton is the first one to release a dog. Yeah, Trenton just uh, dashes out and immediately <laughs> goes and starts lockpicking the cage. And that one by one, the rest of F Society follow her out and they just start freeing it, the puppies. It's such a feel-good uh, kind of lower-stakes comedy moment in this very high-stakes <laughs> episode. And it, in a way, it's almost out of place, but it just speaks to who the characters are so much. I absolutely love it. I especially love that because this is really the last time we get all of F Society together, although we see them later in the end of the world party towards the end of the episode. But this is one of the final moments we get with this crew all together. And so I love that we get this, this kind of feel-good moment. Uh, but I especially love that it's Trenton that starts that and the rest of them just decide, fuck it, and they just follow suit because it's a nice character moment. Sometimes little subtle uh, character movements like that, are they speak larger volumes than a, a whole ream of dialogue does sometimes. And every member um, of F Society that's opening a cage is doing it in a way that there, it speaks about their character. Like, yes. uh, Romero's kind of just doing it because he's like... <sighs> It looks like he's like, well, everyone else is doing it. Like, I guess this is the thing we're doing now. Yeah. Hopefully he's like <laughs> running out to be part of the uh, part of the, the shenanigans. You know, Darlene's all like, oh, this is part of the anarchy and Trenton's doing it because yes. these things need yeah. to be free. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really beautifully played. And so now we finally know for the answer to that question asked us by a certain pop hit in the early 2000s. Who let the dogs out? Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who? Meanwhile, my favourite Meanwhile, scene in all of Mr. Robot. I mean, this is a perfect scene. <laughs> I've got notes on this. My main note on this is no notes that I take will do this justice. <laughs> just, just if you're listening to this podcast, just stop and rewatch this scene. <laughs> yeah, it does speak for itself. But nonetheless, we'll plow on and uh, we'll, we'll scrabble on and attempt futilely yep. to, to encapsulate it. But Elliot attempts to visit Terrell at his home. No answer, of course. Joanna turns up with her baby <laughs> from outside uh, Stephanie Cornelison looking fucking spectacular here uh, in all her weird alien aloofness beauty <laughs> yep at this point in case you're not aware of this this is a good point to drop this in before I say anything spoilers for all of Mr. Robot before we carry on 
In the alternative version of the show where White Rose is a dimension hopping, time traveling supervillain, this is where Joanna Wellick is an Omega level psychic who can mm-hmm. hear Elliot's inner thoughts and the, the way he <laughs> talks to his other personalities. That's the show that I would have been happy to watch as well because he yeah, gets I, so paranoid that Joanna can hear his thoughts and her face yeah. just is like, it's incredible. This again is one of those things where in a less well made show, quite often screenwriters they will write you know checks that an actor's performance cannot cash uh, and this is not one of those times because yeah. uh, Stephanie Cornelison goes over and above what's in the script all we need to know is that Elliot thinks that Joanna is the creepiest most inhuman creature <laughs> that he's ever encountered and Stephanie Cornelison goes to the absolute limits and beyond of what should be possible in a portrayal of that type I mean it's just an incredible performance and we get so little of Rami and Stephanie together that I just love that we have this. To your point though, it does make me a wee bit sad that we get so little of Joanna after season two because I love this quality that the show played with, that there was this alien phenomenon to Joanna's character that I would have been quite happy for them to have just never explained that there just was this quality to her that somehow she everyone around her felt that she was needling around inside their psyche but she absolutely plays it to the hilt and it's incredible and I love the dialogue here, the dialogue is so clever. So let's get into the detail, she lies to him that Terrell has called her and that he'll be here soon and we get this there's these three guys that run past in their F Society masks uh, and they shout in uh, Joanna's face, F Society bitch! Yeah, after one of them falls in his ass <laughs> Yes! <laughs> these are just wee dafties, this is like everyone's been swept up in this F society wave. These these, these seem like TV guys that don't particularly have uh, any political awareness. They're just like, oh, anarchy now, let's do it, mm-hmm. chaos, woo! She asks Elliot, "Who are you?" And his response to us is, "Good question." <laughs> Good question. Yeah, uh, I should say throughout this scene, Matt Quayle gives us for me what is one of his most iconic moments, which I believe is just called Joanna Fishies, yep. <laughs> for spelt P H, um, and. It's another really nauseating kind of drone. And it really reminds me of the kind of thing you would have heard on one of the early kind of experimental scores that you would get in one of those paranoid political thrillers from the 70s of exactly the kind that Sam Esmail loves so much. For sure. Um, yeah, it, it imbues this scene with just so much horror and really, it, it almost makes me feel physically sick watching this episode, <laughs> this scene, because... Uh, and I will say, actually, I actually even love that track on the soundtrack, but my God, it's difficult to listen to. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he feels like she can hear us. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna asks when he last saw Terrell, uh, what they were working on. Elliot claims to have last seen Terrell last week. He realises now that Terrell is not coming and that she has lied to him and that she's trying to ensnare him. Yep. Uh, she says, Joanna says, oh, she says, what did you say your name was again? <laughs> and he says, uh, I'm Ollie. Ollie. <laughs> Immediately lumps Ollie in the shit here, because why not? <laughs> uh, she's worried that Terrell was, has been acting strange recently. Elliot unconvincingly says he doesn't know anything about that. So yeah, she contradicts herself. Uh, but I, I'm unsure how to read that, because it could also be like she's no longer caring. Like She's almost moving in for the kill, like she wants Elliot to be scared. Yeah. Uh, I think you could read it either way. And then she has that moment where she pauses and looks at the baby. As you pointed out before, it looks like she's about to bite into her baby's skull. And then she whispers in Danish, uh, unsubtitled Danish, if you've done anything to him, I will kill you. Yeah. It's a nice little Easter egg there. Sam Esmail didn't write that line. Ah, he just asked Stephanie Cornelison to say something in Danish. Uh-huh. Uh, I found out what that line was uh, fairly recently, actually, mm-hmm. uh, last year when I watched Stephanie Cornelius and do an Instagram live along with mm-hmm. um, the actor who plays Mr. X. Yep. Um, they were talking about it in one of the questions someone asked was, what did you say in that? And she says it was something along the lines of, if you've done anything to him, I'll kill you. Um, mm-hmm. But like, just as an aside, Stephanie Cornelius is inhuman in this scene, like you were saying. We've, she is <laughs> yes. terrifying inhuman, like every bit the impossible to defeat villain, but in real life, she is just the dappiest sweetheart. Like, yeah, yeah. It was like when I watched that Instagram live, I was like, "How are you? 
<laughs> How are you, Joanna Wellick? I know we've said it before. It's Tur- weird. Turns out actors are pretty yeah. good at pretending to be other people who knew. <laughs> it's weird that that's their job, but yeah, she's so good at it. But she does have that moment. Uh, Elliot immediately says, I don't understand what you're saying. And Joanna has that moment where she looks like she's weighing a decision. And again, it's just gestures on Stephanie Cornelison's part that just carry so much weight. Elliot asks her if she's okay. And she's sort of clever enough not to strike now. She just kind of says, leans in in that sort of pseudo-threatening way. Thank you, Ollie. (laughs) (laughs) She says, I think think I've taken up enough of your time, which is the most polite way to say, get out of my face. (laughs) 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 And Elliot sort of stumbles away. Yeah, it's an interesting line that because it's exactly the kind of thing you can imagine someone in uh, Terrell and Joanna's world might say to someone who has entered their office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back at Evil Core, back with James Plough as he's staring down the barrel of the TV camera, about to swap it for another barrel shortly. The interviewer, TV interviewer, is needling him about the billions of dollars of wealth already lost. Uh, and James Plough here looking like a sweatier but slightly less orange Robert Kilroy Silk. Um, <laughs> that's who that guy reminds me of a wee bit. It totally it's, is. It's Kilroy Silk. <laughs> but, you know, he seems like... It's odd that I'm seeing this about someone in the upper echelons of a corporate behemoth, but he seems like a more pleasant man than Robert Kilroy Silk. <laughs> For listeners outside the UK, Robert Kilroy Silk, or Kilroy as he's known over here, is a, a real-life comical figure <laughs> who was... A one-time uh, chat show host, later ill-fated politician. He was an early uh, proponent of UKIP, uh, went on had thereafter to form his own, much like Alex Salmond, he yeah. went on to form his own pro-UK uh, independence party called Veritas, in which he really put the ass in Veritas. Yeah, and he's remembered now just for being the most ludicrous character uh, to have existed outside of fiction. And he was famous for his sunbed tan, giving him an orange appearance similar to that of former President of the United States, Donald Trump. But one of the funniest things you'll see on YouTube, uh, or it even turns up in a GIF sometimes, is I forget the name of the show that Kilroy went on to uh, host. It was a game show that I think lasted for one series. And... One of the catchphrases in it was, will the contestant share or will they shaft? <laughs> do you remember this? I do remember that. <laughs> And when he said the word shaft, he used to say it in an almost sensual way and clench his fist. <laughs> and so there is gifts out there, and you'll see, be able to see on YouTube of just Kilroy delivering the word shaft, clenching his fist. Uh, and when I was watching this scene, I was like, here's this uh, pseudo Kilroy about to give himself the futile shaft. <laughs> you may also find footage on YouTube from Chris Morris's um, TV show just jam of, of a sketch he did entitled The Day Kilroy, the day Kilroy Lost, lost It. <laughs> and that was quite a precognitive sketch because that was really before Kilroy went full Kilroy. Yep. Um, yeah, it's one of, one of many instances in which British satirist Chris Morris uh, has been quite uh, prescient <laughs> in some of his comedy. So, yeah, that'll be a fun thing to put in the episode description, a little link to that. But anyway, this uh, slightly more human version of Kilroy, <laughs> in his last moments, he's about to give himself the shaft. He's given the interviewer the party line. Yeah, he says they're fo- focused on tackling the tech issues and whatnot. Uh, it's all going to be good, don't worry. Calm down, dear, as Michael Winner would say, uh, from a, as a hip reference to a UK advertising campaign from the early 2000s. He says the White House are on, are on their side. People will, people's money will be safe. They'll get their money. The interviewer is saying, well, the data may be impossible to recover. Uh, and he's saying, well, you know, is it, it'll be fine. We, we'll be able to handle it. And she's saying, no, but all the offline backups have been destroyed. How can people not worry? Uh, and I love this moment where he sips his water, pats his lip. And then he just becomes instantly more human. And he says, you're absolutely right. The public should be worried. My life is over. My pension and everything in this company is gone. Uh, he says he's been with the engineers all weekend. Quite simply, nobody knows how to fix it. The only thing they know for certain is that it'll be basically impossible to fix. Uh, there's someone on hand near Angela who tells her that she needs to take care of this. Yeah. Uh, she needs to try and get him back on the party line, as it were. So as she approaches James Plough, he reaches for that bag that was so important earlier. Uh, again, he doesn't make a winner. Calm down, dears. Yep. As he pulls, a gun. pulls from the bag a handgun. Everyone uh, freaks out, starts running. 
He just says he's shearing no more and he's shafting himself. <laughs> and uh, bang. And I gotta say, man, this is one of the most realistic headshot deaths I've ever seen on screen. The way his head just comes back, like, tilts back forward and the blood pours out of his mouth looks so fucking real. It goes back to the Robert Bud Dwyer thing. Like I said, I watched that and it's. It's one of those things that I would never watch it now, but when I was younger, mm. I was you know morbidly curious, and that's what sure. that's what happened. His head went back really briefly, and then just head forward, and just blood poured from his mouth and nose from when the gun went yeah. off. So whoever, like production designed this, obviously was going for like you know they had they had a real life reference of this happening. It's grotesque. I do feel like that was definitely used as a reference. And I know Sam Esmail seems like the kind of guy who has a grim fascination with that story as well. Uh, so, yeah, I do feel like there was a definite reference point in there. But, yeah, it's horrendous. It's so disturbing. It's, <laughs> it's so disturbingly real. And, of course, poor Angela gets it on her shoes. Oh, God, brand new pair of shoes. <laughs> Those are our best shoes, James. Yeah. Um, I've written this down here. James Plough goes off. <laughs> so later in the lobby Philip Price or as we're going to call him from here on Daddy Price albeit he's a secret daddy makes himself available in hindsight in retrospect watching this back his actions towards her are so obviously the actions of a dad yeah but yeah. Well, the first time I watched this through I thought there was and it's it's obviously implied to be like that it seems like he has a romantic of interest yes in yeah, Angela, yeah, yeah. but when you know you're like no no this is pure father it was like paternal the whole time yeah. yeah but yeah I mean that's again it's it's the double genius of this show that it's able to uh, erect these kind of illusions for you while at the same time remaining completely true to the actual truth of what the situation is. And yeah, f- fully, you can see in Michael Christopher's performance that he has been 100% paternal, but it's that kind of paternal that because he just has such a pompous manner that you think, uh, this feels a bit creepy. Yeah. He, yeah, he sort of casually comforts Angela mm-hmm. and invites her to come to a press conference later. <laughs> well, initially he says, he tells her she can go home to recover mm-hmm. like that. She's fully free to do that. And he pauses and has that moment where he says, Oh, you're Terry's reference. My favourite chocolate bar. <laughs> Terry's reference. Uh, as advertised by Don French. <laughs> it's not Terry's <laughs> reference, it's mine. <laughs> now that line, he's, he calls her Terry's reference. Now we know why that is, because Terry is the one who was instrumental uh, in getting her here. But was Philip Price instrumental in getting Terry to do this? Because I'm unclear on that. I think that he probably had a hand in it. I feel like he probably did, yeah. I mean, I, as far as I remember, we don't actually get that confirmed in the show, but looking back, it does make sense that you might have given Terry Colby a nudge. Given what's happened with Terry Colby, I could see Philip Price saying, you know, if you want to get back in good graces with the company, you could do me this small favour. Yep, get this. <laughs> you know, don't ask any questions, and Terry Colby, as we know, is someone who does not ask questions, so... Because she does say later in the episode, you obviously know who I am. And we're like, well, yeah, because you're the person suing. <laughs> yes. And yes. But you're like, no, no, he obviously knows who you are. Yeah, he, he knows no, more about who you are than you do. Yeah. The way he takes the money as he's about to walk away and then just takes the money out and puts it down, and points at her shoes and says... Yes, you're going to need new yeah, shoes. Says, those, those, those won't do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those won't do. Yeah, yeah. She's going to go. She's going to need to go do a Leo Johnson. Yeah. New shoes. Take a drink. <laughs> but that's like the full on most paternal thing I think I've seen him do in this whole episode but also yeah his... totally it's the kind of thing it's the kind of thing a dad does that he, well you're going to need to get yourself a pair of shoes son but also the full the fat stacks he pulls out yes yeah he's prepared he, you know I mean I'm sure his credit's not affected as badly as everyone <laughs> no, else's I've got a weird feeling that he's okay <laughs> but yeah. just in case you know he's got that <laughs> he's got that hard cash never walk out with less than a tenth out yep. All right, so Elliot returns to the parking lot uh, into the SUV. I've written here, take another drink, because it's a pure Twin Peaks return drone throughout this scene. <laughs> the car is empty. I like the way he seems to think that Terrell might be hiding in the boot. <laughs> <laughs> so he's searching for an explanation. Maybe Mr. Robot left a clue. He finds the sunglasses wedged in the sunroof. And of course, they're not really just sunglasses. They're a USB drive. And we got a classic Rami moment where he shouts for Mr. Robot to come out. Yeah, there's a moment that uh, Elliot, as we know him, seems to be sort of like understanding like more and more what Mr. Robot is. 
and he's just mm-hmm. like, yeah, uh, come out. And so he thinks, if I just shout, he'll appear. But I love yes. the way he's like, he's like, I need to, I need to speak to my dad, Mister Robot, whoever he is, whatever he is. <laughs> One thing we should mention here that we didn't mention earlier: uh, the three days that have passed, we came up with all kinds of exotic theories throughout watching the show as it was airing as to what was going on in those missing days, and we never really found out. <laughs> We never really found out the detail was going on in those days. And I love that we never really found out because now we're kind of left to theorise about just how much Mr. Robot was in control at that time and just how much maybe they were moments the original Elliot came back for moments. Mm-hmm. And I love that. I love that it's uh, it just seems to be three days where the only thing we really know about it is that the mastermind was not in control. And he is understandably raging about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know how much the mastermind loves his control. Yep. Meanwhile, fun society. So they're prepping the party. Darlene says they have to go analogue on this shit on account there'd be no guarantee for a working internet for a lot of people. So they're having to go back to the old flyers and whatnot. The others are not quite so enthused. Uh, Darlene says, you guys are actually like we're walking towards Doomsday and Mobley notes the title of the party. And she says, figure of speech. Romero says they're not quite in high spirits because their fearless leader, yeah. quote unquote, shits up the world. Then disappears where they clean up after him again. It was a classic Romero delivery. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, Elliot travels back to the year 2000 to use an old school internet cafe. Uh, he sticks the thumb drive into one of the computers to see boardwalk fail. <laughs> The drive is encrypted, but he posits Mr. Robot knows the password, so Elliot knows the password. Yeah. And without thinking, he just types it in. And there it is. Boardwalk fail. Yes. A Vimeo link. <laughs> it's a meme sensation. <laughs> Remember 2015 when Boardwalk fail was all the rage? <laughs> what is he trying to tell me, he says. Is he trying to tell me I'm on the hook for everything as he watches repeats of himself? <laughs> just falling forward off the fence. And to be fair, it never gets less funny. It's always funny. (laughs) So he decides he has to get himself arrested. So he goes to use the landline. And Mr. Robot steps in. Says, all right, you got me. So over at the shoe store, I love this guy at the shoe store. (laughs) He's an (laughs) anti-capitalist shoe store owner. (laughs) This guy is fantastic. (laughs) So he quick, quickly realises the shoes, uh, the blood is from yeah, James Clough, like, and he just starts thinking out loud, stream of consciousness. So like, how can you work there? They're just liars! He's like, was this from the guy? <laughs> it's fantastic. I love every beat of this yeah. guy's performance. It's just so good. He says, you witnessed this thing and now you're buying shoes? That's cold. You're just like them. And in a way, this is commentary on the, the journey we're beginning to see Angela go on, where she does get into this confused space where it's almost like she doesn't quite know where she belongs. And there's a part of her that does kind of start to get seduced by the corporate world of it all. As I've written in my notes here, she's starting to go at least half price. <laughs> I mean, it's not quite full price. This guy berates her pretty hard out of the blue. And it's like, you know, to bring in I May Destroy You episode 9, it's like when mm-hmm. Arabella starts going overboard on her friends. You know, <laughs> right? Like, yes, yeah, yeah. You get at some point, you just kind of go, no, "Shut up!" <laughs> and Angela, yeah, right, ra- rain it yeah, in. Yeah, Angela goes, "Do you know what? You're pushing me to the right. You're pushing me to full price." <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He goes too far, so she goes too far in response. Are we saying that Angela's journey is all the fault of the shoe guy? I am saying that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mister Clark, as I'm going to call him. <laughs> she says. Uh, he starts getting torn into I, I love, I love the fact he uses, actually uses the phrase "don't drink their Kool Aid." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she doubles down and she says the line that you gave at the start of the episode: "I'll try the Pradas next." Yeah, and he looks stunned, Adelian. Epic fail there, Clark. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, back at the internet cafe, Mr. Robot <laughs> says to Elliot, "Get your caramel latte; it's on me." <laughs> <laughs> That's such a clever that line. That is funny for so many reasons. <laughs> but Elliot is having none of it. Pushes, quote unquote, pushes Mr. Robot against the wall, asking about Terrell. To which Mr. Robot says, you know how this looks, right? Very weird. And we do get the customer's POV, where it's just Elliot holding himself up against the wall by the neck. <laughs> Mr. Robot says the line that you said at the start of the episode. 
<laughs> if you yes. want to get yourself one of those Bluetooth headsets. Bluetooth headsets, just so then they'll think you're just a local douche. <laughs> Which is an excellent plan if you're going to be literally talking to yourself all the time. <laughs> So Mr. Robot says that he and Terrell made a deal that helped us both, quote-unquote. And I love that play of words, because does he mean helped me and Terrell both, or helped you and me both, uh, mastermind? Yep. And this is the this so, is the turning point, This from this scene on. This is when Mr. Robot stops being the nice guy helper. And yeah. for reasons which will become clear later in the season, this is where Mr. Robot becomes essentially an antagonist for a while yeah from this point on through most of season two uh, and even through much of season three yeah there is an antagonistic relationship um between elliot between mastermind and mr robot from this point on and i remember we had conversations about this i'm sure during the time the show was still airing about why we could not quite figure out why mr robot becomes so antagonistic from this point onwards and now, after in the context of having seen the conclusion of the show, it's obvious. It's because he wants the mastermind to just go away, because the, his purpose has been fulfilled. It's like I thought this would do it, and it's not worked, basically. And so, Mr. Robot, and we've already discussed in previous podcast episodes about how frustrated Mr. Robot gets when things don't go his way. And so really what we're seeing here is the maximum level of Mr. Robot's frustration. It's like, fuck this guy. I'm just going to antagonise him every day until he finally goes away. Yep. And he's not alone. He breaks out the whole family in this episode. And they yes, will all become does. much more apparent as the series goes on as well. So there's a definite splintering taking place. Like there was a kind of equilibrium well for the duration of the mastermind being on board with the 5-9 plan but now that's no longer the case it's like why are you still here so he has to, Mr. Robot has to find ways to dig out new tricks Slater's performance is so great I know we say that a lot but he's so great at this particular kind of antagonism where it's uh, you can tell this is a guy who's just pissed off with you Yeah. Uh, and if you just go away everything will be fine Uh and Kristen Slater has just a great way of being the snidiest guy on earth. And I think that's what I love most about the Mr. Robot energy. It's like, it's not comic book villain antagonism. It's, I am just so exhausted with you kind of antagonism that feels way more human and way more real. Elliot asks him where Terrell is. Mr. Robot says... Yeah, he says no one knows where he is but you. He says, I am you. Elliot yeah, says, so you know also. And he's like, no, you're not. <laughs> and Christian Slater's face when he says, is that a fact, is amazing. <laughs> it's peak Christian Slater. And once again, if my Gen X man crush from Christian Slater <laughs> is not going away because his delivery... James 90's man crush collection. <laughs> his delivery of, is that a fact, <laughs> is just... Oh. <laughs> so Mr. Robot approaches uh, this burly looking <laughs> customer... <laughs> Tells him he had sex with his mom this morning and it was fantastic. I love the sound design of when Mr. Robot takes over because this is the first yeah. time we see it and it's the kind of, kind of bzz, bzz, in the slight camera yes. shift. And... and also, we get the close up of uh, Rami's face at the moment and he sort of, I wrote it in, he phases in and out slightly like a Twin Peaks woodsman. <laughs> <laughs> Take a drink. Yeah, but he insists. No, it was real nice smell. Right, because the Barley guys have none of it. The Barley guys are like, I don't have time for you, little man. Yeah, I don't have time for you, little man. Mr. Robot has the ultimate childish finger up to the nose. As we see here in Scotland, smell your ma. <laughs> and it has the desired effect. As the guy immediately stands up. Yeah, okay, you cross the line, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> punches Mr. Robot square in the curtain. Yeah, we get the, the instant switcheroo, and it's Elliot lying on the ground, and Christian Slater approaching from where Elliot was standing. Everything about the way this scene is staged is just so perfect. And we get a great Mr. Robot line here. I was just supposed to be your prophet, you were supposed to be my god. I remember, that was another line I really got confused about for ages, or not, if not confused, I, I used to analyse that line for ages before we got to the end of the series, but what precisely Mr. Robot meant by that, and it's exactly what we were just discussing. Mr. Robot, of course, has a way of uh, fr framing it <laughs> in this very kind of majestic context, uh, a la all the other antagonists in Elliot's life. The role of Mr. Robot, as is set out later in the series, we find out Mr. Robot is the protector. He's there to protect Elliot the way that his father yeah. couldn't, or that his father should have done but didn't. And mm -hmm. the mastermind is Elliot's vengeance and rage. 
but as we find mm-hmm. out, who also is attempting to protect Elliot, but he does it mm-hmm. in a way that is hugely detrimental to Elliot. Yeah. He loves him yeah. so much that he tried to change the world for him. Yes. But he does it by yeah. imprisoning him. <laughs> and it's just seen this whole show in the context of that battle between Mr. Robot and the Mastermind, which becomes so much clearer from this episode on. It's just like, oh. Mm-hmm. One of the things I do I do find most interesting about this relationship now in the context of the finale is that the way in which Mr. Robot's attitude toward the Mastermind does change. Because mm-hmm. uh, in, in Season 4, we actually see Mr. Robot become a bit more sympathetic to the Mastermind. And now, of course, you can argue that that's because he's just realised that that's the better tactic to use at that point. I think that knowing where the show goes and I mean this is my own personal interpretation I do feel like that the Mr. Robot is a bit more sympathetic to the Mastermind he's come to that point where he's like okay I've, maybe I have just pushed this guy too far we are ultimately the same person maybe I should stop punishing him so much maybe there's another way to do this now of course at that point it is when they're about to take down the Deus group so there is no bigger target mm-hmm. so I guess Mr. Robot at that point could be confident that well if this doesn't do it surely nothing will <laughs> You know, yeah, I feel like there's a part of his attitude change is based around the fact that maybe Mr. Robot realizes that every other alter knows they are not Elliot, and the Mastermind mm-hmm. thinks he's Elliot. So in a way, he has to protect the Mastermind as if the Mastermind was Elliot. Yes, yeah, I think that's I think that's about right. I think the other thing as well is that what's key to that moment in season four is that it's just after. Elliot slash the mastermind learns or remembers about the abuse he suffered at the hands of his father and it seems like Mr. Robot while he might not be the only alter that has retained that memory but he he certainly retained it in a way that neither mastermind or as far as we know the real Elliot has mm-hmm. uh, they've, they've both buried it as far as we can tell uh, and so from that respect it feels like in that moment Mr. Robot is a bit more sympathetic towards the Mastermind just because he knows how raw this is and how devastating it is for this element of his what what is ultimately and not just another aspect of his personality you know so it is like damage limitation and sympathy is you know it makes sense uh, he has to learn to be gentle Elliot has to learn how to be gentle to himself uh, and that's kind of one of the beautiful things about I think creating a story where you're portraying a character in, as several different distinct personas is that you get to really play around with the metaphor of how someone treats themselves inside by literally having two different actors treat each other in certain ways. Uh, it's one of the beautiful things that, that this medium can do, and this show did it so well. You know what I love about this also? Like, I can still change my mind about this at some point and interpret it another way, you know? Uh, and I will never stop thinking about this show and finding new things to read into it. That's one of the main reasons why this show is going to stand the test of time, I think. Uh, even even after all the contemporary references that are riddled throughout the show become outdated, the story itself will not become outdated. Because I think there's, there is a truth about human psychology at the heart of all of this that you know, I've not seen done in a way that's been anywhere near as successfully truthful in this way. Yep. Meanwhile. Meanwhile. So Angela turns up at that meeting with the PR department that Philip Price invited her to. Philip Price realises she must have questions, and he's a person, as he puts it, with a lot of answers. Angela wonders why he's so confident. She asks him, you're sure you'll get through this, why? And Philip Price has this spiel about people having done this, aliens didn't invade, it wasn't Zeus, it wasn't zombies, they're just people like you and me. Yeah, it's not one of the big three, to quote Falcon and Winter Soldier. (laughs) And he adds, except, of course, I have the full weight of the biggest conglomerate behind me. Matters like this tend to crack under that weight. I don't think we need to say too much about that, except it's once again another example of this show. Just very being up, be very upfront about the truth of, uh, you know, capitalism and whatnot. Hashtag Woodsy rants about capitalism again. So Angela tries to ask why her, why is she really here? Uh, why is he letting her be here? Or even, why is he even talking to her? None of this makes sense. And I have to say, back when I was first watching season one, not much of it made sense to me either, except I was thinking, is Philip Price just wanting to bang Angela? Is that all this is about? Cause... Yep, and it's really pressing the point here that that's probably what's going on. But no, in hindsight, it's so obvious. Let's pause for a moment there, actually, because let's think about Philip Price and his relationship with Angela just for a moment. Philip Price, he's a weird beast, right? I mean, he is 100%. I don't come away from this show 
feeling much sympathy for Philip Price. I think he has a great fuck you moment to White Rose in season four. It doesn't necessarily make me like him as a human being. But all that said, he convinces me as a human being. Like, he, he comes across as a fully rounded person in this show. Again, I, th- I think it's, you know, a testament to this show is just how well written it is that I think he's all in all a pretty hideous human being still at the end of the story. But there's elements where I sympathise with elements of his story. I'm very sad for the fact that, you know, he had to essentially let Angela die in the way that he did. I think he's 100% genuine in his affection for Angela. It's complicated though, because Philip Price is from a world that's very hyper-patriarchal. And I think it's perfectly arguable that that system and people within it and who uphold it the way Philip Price does, they essentially view their daughters as their property. Uh, And I think there's a strong, strong strand of that here in Philip Price's relationship with Angela. Now, I'm not saying that makes me feel sorry for him any less necessarily, but it does make how I view his sense of sorrow and regret a little bit differently than I would if it was somebody else in a different situation. You know, he is a totally believable character. Yeah. He's an incredibly well-rounded character. Like you say, he is, he's very human, but he's just a human who happens to be a complete bastard. (laughs) Right. And that's so well um, portrayed in this very scene, just before he goes to talk about James Boss. Yes, yeah. I mean, in the Philip Price Angela story arc, uh, if we can call it that for a second, I come away feeling sorry for Angela. I don't necessarily... I've come away feeling sorry for an element of Philip Price. I don't come away from saying, oh, poor Philip Price, because at the end of the day, I'm still on the fuck that guy train. Yeah. Like you say, the moment where he owns White Rose in season four... Is, it's a great moment. It's yeah. brilliant, and I was cheering him on at that point, which is weird because White Rose's villainy is also like deliciously supportable. White Rose is such a good villain... A lot of it's down to B.D. Wong's performance. There's way more elements of White Rose's story that I have greater sympathy for than anything in Philip Price's story. But, I mean, White Rose ultimately is is still a villain. Uh, There are things that she does that I think are unforgivable. And the fact that she's foisting her her experiment on the rest of the world is not cool, man. Not cool. And she kills a lot of people. She really does, yeah. Just because... She has to ask. In fact, it's the end of this episode. It's the post credits scene. Yes. As I'll come to, is the point where Philip Price does something that is going to cost mm-hmm. thousands of lives. Yeah, uh, I had to ask you twice, Philip. Yep. So, therefore, <laughs> thousands of people deserve to die. It's like, no, fuck you, White Rose. But then again, I mean, it's, there is always the caveat that White Rose genuinely believes that all of those people will not have died because there will be an alternate reality where they still live. Yep. Uh, so. Which is what makes White Rose a terrifying villain, because it essentially makes anybody expendable. Yeah, it's what makes the Dark Army so willing to die for White Rose's cause, because they're like, well, it's like any, not to go all F democracy here, but like anyone. <laughs> like any zealotry. Like any zealot, any like one who's willing to like commit suicide for a cause, because they think they're, they're going to be, you know, oh, there's, there's a reward, and the reward for these people is they're going to still be alive in the White Rose's alternative. Yeah. Perfect. Where things are going to be as they should be. Yeah. yeah. So, moving on. <laughs> Price feeds her a line here saying that he finds her refreshing. Young and bold. What we need. <laughs> you hear this kind of corporate bullshit constantly. He's uh, got this big shit-eating grin. Well, shit-eating grin is exactly the phrase that describes that <laughs> grin. Yeah. She sees the uh, picture of James Plough. And he goes, oh, you're still upset about that? Yeah. It's a... Uh, she said, I don't think I'll get it out of my head. And uh, in a bid to console her, it seems like, <laughs> he tells her he's essentially glad that James Plough killed himself. He says, oh, don't worry, he wasn't a good person. He had a gambling problem. He drank too much. He was weak. He says, <laughs> His instincts dis- left a lot to be desired. <laughs> he says, I despise people like that. In fact, I felt the world was a little better off knowing he wasn't in it anymore. Yeah, and yeah. I'm sure his family will be better off as well. Yeah, it's stunning. But this, incidentally, is one of the moments where I remember some of the online fan community, uh, some of the more critical aspects of it, anyway, were 
Uh, kind of criticising this, saying that it just it felt like too much of a, a kind of cliche villain moment and that the character wasn't believable. I think that's totally believable. You're kidding yourself if you think people on the upper echelons of corporatism or the upper echelons of uh, the political system do not talk this way. Yeah. I guarantee you they talk this way. Also, it's not just people in the upper echelons of corporate capitalism that think that way. This scene reminded me of the... Uh, we're back on Bill Hicks. This is a Bill Hicks heavy episode. And um, Bill Hicks' sketch about why you never hear about a positive drug story. Same LSD story every time, and we've all heard it. Young man on acid thought he could fly, jumped out of a building. What a tragedy. What a dick. <laughs> he thought he could fly. Why didn't he take off the ground and check it out first? <laughs> He's an idiot. He's dead. Good. You know, I'm sure many people in their more cynical, hump of hate filled moments, when they hear of someone they object to dying, will be like, will have that, I just felt the world get lighter moment. You know, you don't have to be I tend part to feel of that the way. I, group. I, I tend to feel that way when it's people like Philip Price who die. <laughs> exactly. So you don't need to be, if someone's saying that his character is unbelievable for having that thought, you're like, we all have that thought. Yeah, so he gives that speech, <laughs> and then of course then he, he gets, up. gets up at the lectern. <laughs> Which, by the way, the Nuremberg rally of it all. <laughs> yes, very much, very much. Something I noted during this scene and the way that it was shot as well, the cinematography during the dialogue between Price and Angela is all very warm, honey hue. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because it does come up again, but it's uh, it's sort of, there's this feeling that 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 kind of um, colour profile, we normally see that being used in kind of domestic settings and where there's a strong emphasis on family and on close personal bonds. And I do feel like Sam Esmail being Sam Esmail, knowing that he is, you know, someone who's who's very, very fluent in the language of cinema. I feel like early this was him, even though no one would have picked up on it, that he was instilling this kind of familial sense between Angela and Price at this point. The reason I bring that up is because you see it again. Uh, I'll just mention it here so that I don't have to break this up. But in the in a couple of scenes from now, when Elliot is in Times Square, when uh, Magda and the young Elliot appear, they are bathed in the same kind of honey-coloured light. It, it directly makes reference to that kind of familial bond. So Esmail's a clever guy. He's very good with the visuals. And I know he's, he's very, very fluent in cinematic language. And I do feel like this was... Again, one of those clues nobody ever picked up on, but he was deliberately, I think, putting this in that there was this sort of familial connection between Price and Angela here. For sure. He gets up after, like, character assassinating James Plough to Angela, begins a beautiful eulogy asking for a moment of silence for their brave friend. And their the camera, brave friend. <laughs> the camera pans up over and it is just like the fucking Nuremberg rally. You replace yeah. the E on the ground with a swastika. It's evil empire shit. It's the so design well of that shot. lobby is so incredible as well. Yeah. That location is just perfect. Yeah, great stuff. <laughs> just in case you felt like having any sympathies for evil core, <laughs> Sam Ishmael just like hammers home. This is the evil empire. Yeah, totally. It's interesting what he does here because we're obviously we're inclined to sympathise with Angela because of the time we've spent with her and we know who she is at this point. The the show has already told us that she is being slightly seduced by this. And so we, we do get the Nuremberg of it all, but it's concurrent with, but this is our Angela, she's feeling safe here, she's feeling welcome. It's really, it's done a great job of instilling a whole bunch of very conflicting emotions in the viewer, just as in much as it's imbuing them in Angela herself. Yeah, did not write it here, but damn, this show is good. Then we get to the end of the world party. Needle drop. Needle drop. Oh, old dirty I'm bastard. <laughs> with some Khalees thrown in for good measure. Great shit. Romero muses that the place is now a petri dish uh, with all the attendees. Classic germaphobe Romero there. <laughs> yes, very much. And Mobley concurs there's enough fingerprints here. I think that should do the trick. So Darlene insists that everybody just relax, party, thank themselves for their hard work. And Mobley and Trenton both looking a bit uneasy, wondering what's next. And this is the second instance in this episode where I've referenced earlier that Darlene is showing a little bit of naivety or a little bit of short-sightedness uh, and a little bit too much of the idealising what they've done and not enough about the practical thinking about what comes next. 
Uh, she says, this isn't about what we'll do tomorrow. It's about what we did in this room. We're finally awake, finally alive. Repeating Elliot slash Mr. Robot's words, Darlene's very much in a moment here where she's fallen in love with the idea of being a political revolutionary, but she's forgotten that in order to do that, you need to have a plan for what happens post-revolution. And to take it back to something we were talking about last episode, Darlene is having her last scene of Fight Club moment at this point. You know, there's right, no need yeah. to think about what comes next. This is their big victory, you know, this is her party. Meanwhile... So there's an army of uh, people with F Society masks on the streets. Our streets, as they're now known. And we kind of get a reversal of the graveyard scene uh, from previous episodes, with Mr. Robot now leading a limping Elliot through Times Square. Elliot says he knows that Mr. Robot killed Terrell. Uh, Mr. Robot is sick of Elliot's whining. Which, again, just speaks to what we were saying earlier about how Mr. Robot is feeling about the mastermind still hanging around at this point. Elliot begs us to do something. <laughs> Make him tell me. <laughs> and Mr. Robot, stop talking to them. They can't help us. We have to do this. Just us. And it, it's not just Christian Slater's voice, though it's Christian Slater and Rami Malek's voices overlaid at that point. It's, it's really so clever. well done. Uh, and that's when Magda and, as I reference him here, Kid E turn up, uh, Radiohead's uh, lesser known um, experimentalist electronic album. And they say, he's right, you're hurting the whole family. This is an interesting moment because I do feel like this is amongst all the other stuff. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on here that we could muse about endlessly. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that's certainly going on here is that this is an expression of one of the many instances of Elliot's, the real Elliot's own self-loathing and his own guilt that he's buried subconsciously. This whole thing about you're hurting the whole family, and it's you know it, it goes back to what we see him excavate from himself in season four, where he finally has to face up to the guilt of not having done enough to defend his younger self. Um, I also just love the the little cinematic thing of how his younger self, the voice is there but the mouth isn't moving. Yeah, that's really creepy, so man. Creepy, uh, yeah. I actually skipped back on that bit just to see that because i don't for some weird reason i don't think i'd picked up on that before but i just remember noticing it this time going oh, what that's really weird but yeah he's trying to tell us that they aren't my family none of this is real uh and mr robot insists neither is whoever you're talking to elliot insists mr robot isn't real mr robot then goes on to goes into the whatever in here the jean baudrillard of it all what you are is any of it real I mean, look at this. Look at it! A world built on fantasy. Synthetic emotions in the form of pills. Psychological warfare in the form of advertising. Mind-altering chemicals in the form of food. Brainwashing seminars in the form of media. Control isolated bubbles in the form of social networks. Real? You want to talk about reality? We haven't lived in anything remotely close to it since the turn of the century. Turned it off, forgot the batteries, snacked on a bag of GMOs while we toss the remnants in the ever expanding dumpster of the human kingdom. We live in branded houses, trademarked by corporations built on bipolar numbers, jumping up and down on digital displays, hypnotizing us into the biggest slumber mankind has ever you seen. Have to dig pretty deep, kiddo, before you can find anything real. We live in a kingdom of bullshit, a kingdom you've lived in for far too long. So don't tell me about not being real. I'm no less real than the fucking beef patty in your Big Mac. As far as you're concerned, Elliot, I am very real. We are all together now, whether you like it or not. And I don't know about you, but maybe it's just me fresh from watching Twin Peaks The Return again. But this entire speech is peak Dr. Amp energy. It's official, Elliot. The fucks are at it again. <laughs> Take your way out of the shit. <laughs> it's seven o'clock. Do you know where your mind is? It's seven o'clock. What's your ask? <laughs> Incidentally, Matt Quayle copyright claimed the last episode of YouTube, so it's definitely... Well, of course he did. This, incidentally, is a different version of the theme. It's a very intense, frenetic version that has a really abrupt ending. It's one of my favourite versions. It's not. We should actually say, even though the first instance we ever hear is called What's Your Ask, it, it's not actually the official title of that theme because the theme comes back with many different titles and different variations but yeah that's one of my favorite ones yeah so uh, mr robot even says we live in a kingdom of bullshit <laughs> he has to shovel himself out of the bullshit i'm totally on this dr amp kick i'm sorry 
I, got, I was actually laughing all the way through this scene. <laughs> like, I was, I was imagining Russ Tamlin just delivering all the same dialogue. Uh, <laughs> note here that uh, when Mr. Robot says, I'm no less real than the fucking beef patty in your uh, <laughs> Big Mac. Big Mac was redacted on the original uh, broadcast of this episode. Did you oh, really? know Really? I did not know that, no. <laughs> because of copyright. Is that not weird? That's hilarious. <laughs> It was a fucking beef patty and you're... <laughs> <laughs> Cut back to Michael slash Lenny sitting at home eating his McDonald's. <laughs> and then all the protesters chant their support for F Society. Major chills in this scene, man. Because, you, you know what's great about this scene? The protesters I'm really loving on this, firstly on a visceral level, also on a kind of political level. I'm like, yes, this makes me really excited, all yep. this shit happening. Uh, but also the crisis that Elliot is going through in this moment, that he cannot even enjoy this moment because he's having this meltdown. There's just so much going on and the scene is it's just insane and it's so well put together. And he says, I want to be alone. I need to be alone. And then silence and emptiness in the street. We get the beach wind and the gulls evoking their uh, family photo from Coney Island. Yeah. An empty Times Square, which must have been a real fucker to film. <laughs> yeah, that place is really empty. Yeah. <laughs> so Mr. Robot and Magda and Kid E appear on the screen. Mr. Robot tells him, you don't want that. Uh, back then you were in pain, you were alone, and that's why we're here. Uh, he talks about those lonely nights when Elliot sat and cried, and you begged, he, he begged them to help him. You asked us to come, you needed us to come. And again, it's like, uh, it's, another, it's another needle into that fact about Elliot's inability to cope with the totality of the truth of his own experience. And Kid E says, we're deep down inside you, you can't leave us and we can't leave you ever. And Magda says, it's true, son. Uh, she's giving it the son, the same way Mr. Robot does, so uh, yeah, it's needling, needling away at that. And Elliot just does not know what he's supposed to do. But I know what he's made to do. He's made to stick on a needle drop for Alabama shakes, sound the colour. That'll mellow us all out. Mr. Robot tells him to go get on his train, go home get on his computer and watch and enjoy the beautiful carnage. Yeah, it's an ingenious use of this song because the lyrics are all about opening your eyes and finding a new world, um, ostensibly. Yep. Uh, and it's a, such a mellow tune that's been laid over this, the dawn of a new world and its most chaotic moment. It's just one of those juxtapositions that this show does really well. Well, we see Elliot on the train with his hood up in full protection mode. And we see the kids playing outside at night outside Elliot's apartment. There's just so many nice touches here that it really fill out the world at this moment. We see him watch the protest footage. The world leaders, we've got another bash of uh, montage, world leaders, politicians scrabbling. Then we get heavy knocking at Elliot's door. Who could that be? Who could that be? I'll be honest, because of the tricks this show plays and because this episode was so immersive, I'd already forgotten about Lenny. <laughs> and so he was not on my mind when this happened. I mean, admittedly, I binge-watched the first two seasons together. I never, uh, I didn't experience a space between the two of them. So maybe if I'd had more time to consider, I might have started to theorise, oh, maybe it's the police turning up because Lenny has uh, uh, got the information he needs. And the police now are able to, to find Elliot. But I was not thinking about that. I think I started watching season two the following day. I did not have time to ruminate on this. No, I, first time I watched it, thought it was Terrell. I was like, it's got to be Terrell, right? I was thinking it might be, or someone related to Terrell, or possibly it was just going to be a new character, or I, I, I don't know. Possibly even another alter. Who knows? You know what I mean? There were so many possibilities. But I'd completely forgotten about Lenny, uh, even though the episode explicitly set it up right at the start so he goes to the door and credits yep. blackness we don't see it's kept a secret and we think wow end of the first season eh yeah that's it it's done Dunzo Washington guess we're out here no more Mr. Robot wait limo what's this limo is this an episode of F snobriety <laughs> <laughs> so we get what we now know to be Minister Zhang being driven up in a limo to a gathering of the Deus group. There's a harpist playing a song entitled Nearer My God to Thee, <laughs> on the nose. All on the nose, yeah, but it's, it's on the nose in the best way that this show does. 
But we only see Zhang from the back at this point because I guess the show is trying to keep it quiet that this is BD Wong. I will say, when I first watched this, I recognised BD Wong instantly. So I knew that it was him, but I was like, wait a fucking second. What's going on here? It just made me so confused. And then, of course, when you see Price... So Zhang gets cosy with Price by the fire, and they've got their backs to it. And I like that as though it's kind of they're sort of unconcerned with the world being in flames yeah, behind them. Yeah, they're looking away from Rome burning, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And so Price asks Zhang what's on his mind, and Zhang brings up the Colton Mines, as you referenced earlier. Uh, and it, it, this is our first reference here of that. Yeah. Uh, and Price would like for the moment to take in the music, and of course, Price. God damn it, <laughs> you should have answered. He says the fucking Congo can wait. <laughs> right, yes. But I love it. This is like even before you see BD Wong's face, the yes. answer he gives is like, you're still on that. And he says, you asked and I answered succinctly. Yes, yeah. Oh, it's crazy how well this was planned out, man. It's yep. it's just wild. This is a very different face worn by Price here as that one to the one he showed Angela. Yep. <laughs> Price says that Ecor know who's responsible and that they'll handle it. So they're already on the train here that they believe Terrell to be responsible. Price says that Zhang seems preoccupied. Zhang does not believe in preoccupation, uh, but he, he notes that Nero played a liar similar to the harp that's being played here. Legend has it that he played it merrily as he watched Watch Beep. <laughs> Yep. As he watched Rome burn, uh, <laughs> and that watch beep is unnecessary because, like I said, I knew it was BT Wong, but when you, it's still great when it happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay, before we get into too much of the cast, I just want to say this is a perfect way to end a season. First of all, this, there's a way in which this entire episode almost feels like the first episode of a second season. It sort of feels like a different show to the rest of the first season. Because we are very much in a different world in so many ways. So many of the characters just seem to change suddenly at this point because of the tumultuous events. And the whole tone of the show seems really different here. And what I love about this post credit scene is that it explodes the world. It explodes the perspective of the world we've been in- introduced to. We now know that who's going to be our main villain is operating on a much grander level than we might have assumed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so all of the things that White Rose was talking about have a very real possibility of being rendered real because she's fraternizing with people who are at the top of the world, you know? Anything is possible. So it's really exciting for for that reason. Okay, when we first watched this, how were you feeling about... What were you thinking about what was going on in between these two characters? I was mostly left with a sense of... I think I, I had the sense that the show intends, which is... Wait, White Rose knows Philip Price. Who the fuck is White Rose? <laughs> I didn't even really think at first about wait, and who are all these other people in this fucking room? What who are yeah. all these like obvious like shakes and stuff that are in here? Right. I thought it was just some weird fucking like old timey social club. And then as I more started to think about more, it was like, is this just like some secret fucking cabal of the super powerful people who run the world? And then as it turns out, yep, that's exactly what, that's it, exactly was. what it was. Yeah. But BD Wong being there just confused me so much because I was like, well, who is this person? Why is it that this person is on the same level as Philip mm-hmm. Price? And yet they're meeting Elliot in the Faraday cage in Blank's disc. What the yeah. fuck is going it's on? Unscrewing a disc drive. <laughs> also, I love the cyclical nature of this first season because the first thing we hear Elliot talking about is that secret cabal of people who run the world. And season one ends on there they are. Exactly the that thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting the way, I mean, it's not the only way this show plays a long game, but uh, it does play the long game with the Deus group. It's not even named until season four, and we don't actually see it again until season four. God damn it, Sam. You can't keep getting away with it! But looking at it now, I am astonished, and I know, listen, for people who listen to this podcast, maybe hoping at one point we'll get maybe get more critical of the show than we are being. <laughs> It's not going to happen. I don't know what to tell you because I do just, this show just wows me with how perfect it is in terms of everything working perfectly on a repeat viewing where all of the Easter eggs are still, I, I can see exactly how, why they work for me in the mystery box type way the first time round and they now work for me in the full context of everything I know at the end of the show in a way that's still rewarding. It takes great writing to pull that off, and this show pretty much pulls it off across the board. Because I think the relationship between these two characters, between Price and Zhang, the actors' performances here are so on point. Like, 
this is exactly how we will see them interact with each other from here on in. The, this performance here is no different. The, the energy is exactly the same. Uh, and you do get the sense here that these characters have a, have had a long storied past, you know? Uh, and it, and it's, con- it's communicated in nothing more than a few brief lines. It's so good. God damn it, it's good. <laughs> it tells so much without having to really say anything. The line about watching Rome burn... First time I watched this, I knew that's what Zhang was going to say. It's obvious that's what they're going to say. But, and it's the kind of thing, it's like, do you need to say that line? Again, it's a bit on the nose, but fuck it, it's a good line. <laughs> if a line, if a good line is on the nose, let it, let it go. And if that good line has been delivered by BD Wong, then I say fucking deliver it. Yeah, no, over. fuck it. Right? Pummel my nose. <laughs> yeah, not enough good stuff can be said about BD Wong's performance in this show. The guy's a legend. <laughs> yes, yeah. He's an international treasure. Yep. So yeah, that's what we're left with. End of season one. So I have brief notes about the future scenes in season two, season three that refer back to the 5-9 hack. Season two, episode one, the intro that we get, and we will obviously talk about this more when we continue our coverage of Mr. Robot Rewatch, but we get at Fun Society, Terrell and Ellie on the night of the hack. Terrell notes that the mask is a bit silly. <laughs> Uh, and he immediately gets a call on his mobile phone and it's from an Ecor tech that he's been in contact with who is taking care of the honeypot for him. I know it's funny about this, Terrell's off screen when this conversation actually takes place and the sound mix is really low and it's the kind of thing you can miss and it actually turns out to be quite important. Terrell tells the tech to refuse all of Gideon's requests and escalate this and this is all taking place while Elliot is at the computer messaging with the Dark Army. And when you're, you're first watching this scene, all of your attention is on what Elliot is doing. Because he's asking the Dark Army if they can go tonight. And the Dark Army say something like, the winds of the heavens shift suddenly and so does human fate, so we will make an exception. <laughs> and so that's how it goes down. Terrell tells Elliot that the honeypot is sorted, and so Elliot executes. So we do get a sense from what little we hear on Terrell's conversation that the tech is suspicious. Uh, and so that's why Ecor know, quote unquote, know that it was Terrell. Mm-hmm. And then we get that great sequence Terrell watches and compares it to something coming alive. And that's when Elliot reaches for Chekhov's popcorn gun. <laughs> so in season three, episode three, which is the episode where it's very Terrell centric, it gives us the full backstory of where uh, Terrell was during his absence from season two. Mr. Robot pulls the gun, Chekhov's popcorn gun, on Terrell, and of course the gun jams, because James, as o- you noted... Oil and salt is not good for a gun. When will people learn? <laughs> Stop storing your <laughs> weapons in popcorn machines. Terrell does a Pulp Fiction-esque uh, John Travolta, Samuel L. Jackson pause, check himself that he hasn't been shot, uh, and he tells Mr. Robot that this is proof, and then he does the great classic Terrell laughing like a madman, uh, you told me I couldn't see what was above me, only in front of me. To which Mr. Robot replies, what the fuck are you talking about? By the way, and we can talk about this more when we get there, but I just want to bring it up here. I'm still unsure whether that means Mr. Robot didn't tell him that, and whether that was another part of Elliot that told him that, or whether Mr. Robot is merely reacting here to Terrell being crazy and is saying, what the fuck are you talking about, as in, where the fuck are you going with this? I sort of go back and forth on it. Because, obviously, we do see that scene again with Rami Malek. Like, we never see Mr. Robot say that line. Yes, yeah. Because it's when they get out the car, which is a, a part of the scene we don't see until season two. So, yeah. I don't know. We can discuss that further down the line, but it's one of the many uh, enigmas that Mr. Robot has left us with. But Terrell insists that they're gods, and uh, Mr. Robot says Terrell's a lunatic. <laughs> Trail ponders what the chances are of the gun jamming. He says that was an act of God. We've been invited to lead the revolution. All because of popcorn grease, man. But him saying it was an act of God actually also calls back to something Magda says in the flashback when Elliot throws himself out the window. Magda says to Edward that God says there are no accidents. And she says it repeatedly. So Mr. Robot says... Terrell hasn't been invited anywhere. Terrell realises that Elliot must have a second stage to the plan. He's smart enough to know that Ecor will recreate the data and that's where Terrell is going to be needed. So this kind of confirms that's where Terrell, that's what Terrell's plan was. That's how he got involved in this. Um, so yeah, the rest of it we don't need to get into except for the fact that all that else that happens in that scene is Irving turns up and informs 
Terrell that indeed what happened was the tech at Ecor he'd been talking to had informed Ecor that this was a bit suspicious and someone should check it out. Dark Army got wind of that, and so they sent Irving in, and so that's when Irving turns up and says, if you guys have seen me, that means you fucked up. And that's when uh, Ellie gets told to F off, basically, and uh, Terrell gets taken away to his cabin in the woods where he does a shining, and then gets interrogated by Wallace Shawn, the legendary Wallace Shawn later in season three, which is all good stuff. But yeah, I thought it was important just to look at that, just so that we know from the the context of what we watched here, looking back at the night of the five nine hack. Obviously, yeah. this is stuff that the mastermind doesn't remember. A lot of shit goes down. Yeah, it was a hell of a night, as uh, Schoolboy Q said, yep. <laughs> in an earlier episode of Mister Robot. <laughs> <laughs> what a show! Well done. Yeah, I did note here though that absolutely none of this accounts for Elliot Steelos days, so that still is a lasting enigma. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that'll be a uh, another comic book. Oh, we can but hope. Put out the comic Black Mask. God damn it. Put out the F sobriety origin story, as I <laughs> accidentally said. As your best Freudian slip. Freudian sobriety. <laughs> that wraps it up for Mr. Robot Rewatch Season 1. We got through a whole season, James. I'm proud of us. Well done. We're pretty good at this TV rewatch. We should keep it up. I just want to say, um, and I said it at the start when we did our very first episode of this, I just want to reiterate how happy it makes me through doing this. I love this show so much, and just to be diving deep into it is so much fun. There's never going to be a point where I don't find either new things to be thrilled by or just ways to look at old things in a, in a slightly different way. And spend the time with these great characters, and you know, a show that's this well made, I love it so much. Hashtag fangirling all day. Uh, it's sure. never going to get old. And hopefully, listeners out there have uh, joined us in this journey this far. Hopefully, you're enjoying it as much as we do. Yep, let us know your thoughts. But before you let us know your thoughts, I think it's time we give our final thoughts. And our final thoughts in the form of a uh, completely arbitrary rating system. Craig? Yeah, so first for this episode and then for the season. So, fives out of nine for this episode of Mr. Robot. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Season 1, episode 10. I am scoring this. This is going to be a shock to everyone, and you heard this here first, I guarantee you. <laughs> I'm scoring this 9 fives out of 9, James. Colour me surprised. Set faces too stunned. I am going to give Mr. Robot, Season 1, episode 10, zero day. Also, 9 fives out of 9. How about that? Who saw that? <laughs> it, how could have foreseen this event? I mean, it is a perfect episode of television again, and it's a perfect way to close out a season. We keep saying it, but it's a fact. <laughs> I'm sorry, like you said earlier on, uh, if you're listening to this hoping for a, a more critical analysis of Mr. Robot, I'm afraid you're yeah. listening to the wrong podcast. I mean, there are elements that I, 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 I will pick up on, but none of them are ever, like I was saying earlier, with whatever the two things were I picked up on, they don't linger. You know, there are things that I'm like, this show is good enough that it doesn't matter. And I, on the other hand, <laughs> will die in the hell that there's literally nothing wrong with this show. <laughs> so, you know. I mean, th- this final episode does so much to underscore everything you thought you knew about this show and also turn it on its head simultaneously. And the way it teases the next season by explicitly telling us that all of the characters are going on a very different journey next season. It's impossible to conceive of TV writing that's better than that. That's exactly everything TV needs to do. Mm-hmm. And the fact it did it with so many amusing moments, so many, so many disturbing moments, so many exciting moments. Across the board, masterclass stuff. Now, here's the thing. I'm no maths genius, Craig. You astound me, Holmes. So, I'm not sure how one averages out all my scores over season one. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to go ahead. I've got a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> yeah. Hold me back. I'm going to go right ahead and give <laughs> season one of Mr. Robot nine fives out of nine as a season of television. Colour me amazed. Well, James, it will shock not you and absolutely nobody else. Should I prep the uh, PB's Funhouse you should, secret yeah. word noise for it? Because I am scoring season one of Mr. Robot nine fives out of nine. A perfect yeah! nine. Incredible. <laughs> now, here's the thing. If... I can't imagine why, but if for some reason you've listened to this podcast so far and you've never watched Mr. Robot (laughs) and you just like to hear other people talking about stuff, I implore you to go and watch it. Even knowing all the spoilers we've dropped, doesn't Mm -hmm. matter. Just watch it. It is stunning. Also, if for some reason you've done that 
if for some reason you've listened to this whole thing without watching <laughs> Mr. Robot. First of all, what please, is wrong with you? Say, let, let us know. Leave us a comment and send us a tweet. It'd be fascinating <laughs> oh, to find oh, we out. We would love to hear from you, absolutely. Yeah. I want to hear what your reasoning is. <laughs> There's a reason it is my favourite television programme in history, and it's because it is... Turns out it's pretty decent. <laughs> ...infinitely rewatchable. The biggest difference, obviously, is when you've watched seasons one through four, the way that the final episode recontextualises the entire series... So that when mm-hmm. you rewatch it again for the first time, you really pick up in everything that you're like, and it seems so obvious that you should have seen what it was before. Right. But again, you do another rewatch and you start to pick up in more stuff, and things gel together more. And uh, it doesn't just benefit from it; demands repeat viewing. Uh, yeah, it does. No, I agree. I, it's, it's a show that's made for rewatching, which is why I'm surprised there are not other Mister Robot rewatch podcasts out there. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm glad we've got that niche. Yep. So, uh, if anyone else is thinking about starting a Mr. Robot Rewatch podcast, fuck you, we got there first. <laughs> <laughs> what James means to say is, welcome to the club. <laughs> welcome to F Society. Yeah, welcome to F Sobriety. If anyone would like to do an F Sobriety re listen podcast, <laughs> me and Craig are both available <laughs> as guests. Right, well, that wraps up Mr. Robot Rewatch season one coverage. I think our plans for the immediate future as we're going to take a slight Mr. Robot break at least a couple of episodes or so we'll see how it goes so yeah we're not quite certain what we're doing for the next couple of episodes but we've got a few ideas we're going to bat some stuff around and whatever it is we'll have some fun stuff ahead we'll have fun doing it and hopefully you will have fun listening to it those of you who are sticking with us I think we might just cynically go for those podcast download numbers and do another non-TV music related podcast (laughs) I feel like we are are definitely overdue a music related podcast and I would like to get back into one I'm not yet decided who my subject is going to be for listeners who are not familiar, we did drop a few months back one sort of uh, experimental <laughs> attempt at doing uh, a music theme podcast where we each pick an artist, a contemporary artist of our choice, and give our reasons as to why that artist is vital to the contemporary landscape. It went pretty well, and it is literally our most popular episode <laughs> in terms of downloads. So I feel like we should probably press ahead with another one of those, try and make those a bit more regular. It's what the kids want, the kids' TM. So yeah, I've not decided who it's going to be. I've got a list of artists that I think would be really fun to explore. And uh, Yeah, we'll see how it goes. That could very well be the next episode. I feel like we should do a Doom Patrol Season 2 episode at some point. Yes, yeah, so we need to be prepped for Season 3 when it arrives. So a Doom Patrol Season 2 episode is definitely on the cards at some point. You, of course, have been watching Euphoria. So we'll be getting, we will do a Euphoria episode at one point just to recap on what's happened. And then when that returns, we will do coverage on that as well so those those are the loose plans for the moment uh but we will keep you guys posted as and when in the meantime all that remains is for us to say once again as ever thank you for listening we appreciate it yeah we really appreciate it uh and uh if you enjoy what we do then please do tell a friend uh do the likes do the shares help us get out there to more people spread the love and we will try and reflect it back at you We'll do our best. Uh, Hamiltron has all of our socials. She'll run them by you over the end credits. In the meantime, let me just how's your drink here. looking, James? Well, this here uh, bottle of Green King's East Coast IPA TM uh, <laughs> doesn't quite look half empty. Doesn't quite look half full. I would go so far as to say fifty percent situation, or as we like to say, that's half, half the, the bottle. bottle. Toodle pip. F Sobriety Episode 15, Less Chunk, More Dissonance, was conceived by Craig Woods and James Hamilton, edited by James Hamilton, and is a production of Half the Bottle. The theme music is Colossal Estates, by Errors, available on Rock Action Records. Why not become part of our controlled isolated social media bubbles, on Facebook at facebook.com slash fsobrietypodcast, on Twitter at fsobrietycast, and on Instagram at fsobrietypodcast. You can find us on YouTube, if you look hard enough for F Sobriety Podcast, and why not do us a solid, and hit that subscribe button while you're there. Don't tell me about being real, I'm no less real than the fucking beef patty in your redacted burger brand.